Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff. Eric, what's going on, man? How are you? Freezing my ass off! <laughs> it's, it's, it uh, it, I woke it's, up yesterday morning, it was 37 degrees below zero. <laughs> what? Wait, is that a real number? That's a real number, and that was without the windshield. There was no wind yesterday. So that's not the windshield, that's the actual temperature. That's the air temperature. 37 well, degrees. It's not as bad. It was 17 below this morning, but yesterday was like frigid. <laughs> well, as you recall from living in Atlanta, when you get snow in the South, it is a, it's a daunting task. I don't really understand the difference, but I guess there's more ice in our snow than there is in other parts of the country because of the humidity that's in the air. Anyway, that's happening today in Alabama as folks are listening to this. So I'm going to be stuck here at the house for like three or four days. So if you want to record any bonus content, Eric, as long as I got power, I'm your man. I don't think I'll be able to leave this week. Oh, and you've got no college football. Oh, we got to talk. Dude, end of an era. Nick Saban. Right? How's everybody taking it in Alabama? Man, we closed school the next day. Uh, it was uh, it was a state holiday. It was rough. But what a story, you know, for our new coach. Lose the national championship on Monday. Be named Nick Saban's successor on Friday. Just an absolute crazy week that he had, but yeah, a new era in Alabama and, uh, Bill Belichick leaving his post for the Patriots. It's uh, it really is the end of an era in both college and professional football and a bunch of crazy playoff games this last weekend. I'm excited, man. We're, we're knee deep in the playoffs. Now, do you have an early favorite on the NFL side? Do you have a prediction as to who's going to be in the Super Bowl, Eric? No, I, I, I don't. I, I, uh. I don't follow, I, you know, I enjoy it, especially during playoffs and, and, and this time of year, I really, really dig it, but I don't really follow football closely enough to, to invest too much. And once the Steelers are out of the picture and it's just a sentimental favorite, man, there's no reason why it, I feel the way I feel. I just do. But once the Steelers are kind of out of it, then I, you know, I'm casually interested, but I, I guess I'd like to see Kansas city win. I'm not even sure why, just because I think Patrick Mahomes is such a great talent, but he's still so young and so much came at him so fast. And I think getting into the Super Bowl and possibly winning the game, I know it'll sound funny, but I think it'll settle him down for the rest of his career. Mm. I just think there's so much external, there's a lot of bright, shiny objects moving around in his orbit right now. He hasn't had a lot of great consistency the latter half of the year from what I've been able to hear and watch. So I'd, I'd like to see him in it just to kind of solidify himself and, and settle down and focus on the rest of his career. Well, I, uh, I'd love for my friend, John, uh, our, our pals up at Jimmy's famous seafood to uh, go all the way with the Ravens. I think that could be fun. I know half of my family are Cowboys fans. And unfortunately our video producer, Mr. Dave Silva is too. So we'll see what happens, man. But this is where football gets really, really fun the playoff season. And boy, today's show is going to be really, really fun because we're going to throw out what we normally do. And we're going to talk about a lot of current stuff because there's been so many headlines this last week. Yes. Including what you think we're going to talk about. We are going to talk about that. I guess, first off, I should just thank Cassio for stepping in and covering for me last week. My wife had a big birthday and we took the big trip out of town and he was able to cover for me. So I'm glad you guys, uh, kept the train on the tracks, but the beat goes on in professional wrestling. And there were so many headlines. Let's talk about some of our friends. First, Mickey James was named the OVW creative director, head of female talent and executive producer. She's obviously going to be working closely with our buddy, Al snow. This is a big deal, a big deal and a big get for OVW. Is it not? It is, you know, Mickey's been around the industry for a long time at very high levels, working in smaller companies like TNA. So she's got a wide breadth of experience, breadth of experience. And, I, and she brings a lot to the table. She certainly got a lot of passion for the business. But one of the things when I first read that, in fact, I think I commented, commented on it in social media <clears throat> was the opportunities that come with this. Given what OV has, OVW has done with the wrestlers on Netflix, last I heard at least, there was discussion about another season. That's right. Um, bringing someone like Mickey in from a woman's point of view, because I can tell you 
with 100% certainty based 100% on experience and not my intuition or gut instinct that when you're selling shows, especially to a, a platform like Netflix or anywhere, really anywhere, this applies really anywhere, um, you need that female component. You mm. need a balanced cast of characters. So I think because Mickey's, first of all, she's got so much equity with the wrestling audience. Everybody knows who she is. That's what I yeah. mean by equity. Mm -hmm. You're not, you're not breaking in somebody that nobody's ever heard of before. Um, she brings a lot of equity to the table. She brings a lot of talent to the table. This is not, I'm not even addressing anything that Mickey could contribute in terms of actual training. I'm just talking about this potential, uh, another series or two out of Netflix. She's telegenic. She's great on camera. She's got great talent. She's experienced. She's got equity and it opens the door up demographically to make that uh, Netflix project even more successful. So I'm, boom, I'm here for it. Good. Good on you, Mickey. Yeah. Congrats to OVW and Mickey. Of course I should mention as well that, uh, She's going to be a big part of Starcast down under stay tuned for more details. We will have more details on that, but Brett Hart's going to be there. And, uh, I don't know how often he makes trips to Australia, but Mickey, Brett, oh my more to come as well. Uh, speaking of new people going new places, how about our old pal, the former Dolph Ziggler, Nick Nemeth is going to be a part of the TNA roster. So it seems they ran their first TNA show. After the rebranding, going back to the old name, when I grew up on, if you will, it happened out in Las Vegas and it was their big pay-per-view. I really enjoyed the show. AJ Francis was there. I think a lot of him and, and, and he and Joe Hendry just had a fantastic spot there. Lots of great wrestling, lots of great action. They've had a great roster, but it feels like now they have some really cool momentum and what a star, the former Dolph Ziggler, now a part of TNA. What'd you think, Eric? I was excited about it. Now I didn't watch it. I don't want to lie. I did watch a little bit of collision, um, last night. Uh, I, in particular, I wanted to watch Dustin Rhodes. I knew he was going to be on the show. So I made an appointment and uh, made sure I was able to drop in on that. So impressed with, with Dustin. It's incredible at this stage of his career. Notice I didn't say it is age at this stage of his career. Uh, and as he pointed out in the promo, I think 35 years in the professional wrestling industry and to see a guy as big as Dustin. Um, move the way he moved in his match last night and pick up a win. I thought was pretty, pretty damn cool. But going back to Nick and, 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 uh, TNA, I, I'm here for it. Anybody that's listened to this podcast over the last five and a half years, absolutely knows. I am a big Nick Nimeth fan. Is it Nimeth or Nimeth? Either way. I'm a we'll big with Dolph it. Ziggler fan, former Dolph Ziggler. I love the way they brought him in. It was a surprise. No buzz, no chatter over deliver over deliver a big name. And I think I talked about it either here or, or on strictly business, by the way, AJ Francis top dollar is going to be joining us on strictly business this week. So be sure to check that out when it drops, subscribe here at 83 weeks, do it now, like it, subscribe it, do all that good stuff. So you'll know when that uh, strictly business episode drops with top dollar. Uh, but no, I'm excited for it. And it seems like TNA is kind of making a commitment. They, they, rebranded themselves <clears throat> or re rebranded themselves, whatever. Everybody knows what I mean. Whether you think that was a good idea or a bad idea, it doesn't really matter. It was a big, it was a move. It was yeah. a step. So let's see where that step takes them. But to bring in a guy, and we were talking about equity with regard to Mickey, come on now, former Dolph Ziggler. How much television time has he had over the last 10 years? A million hours. You know? If you look at him like a credit card, he's got a huge limit on him that's available to TNA. So a lot of good moves there. And like I said, rebranding, now bring in and do it artfully. Uh, a big surprise, legitimate, credible surprise. Maybe there's a refocus and, and more energy there. And I'm going to be tuning in as a result. It's a, it's a brand new name. It's a, they're turning over a new leaf. They've got brand new titles and they've got a lot of great talent. You know, Okada was there this weekend. They had a three-way dance on the pay-per-view with Vikingo, Kushida, and Chris Saban. Uh, Josh Alexander took on the former MLW, uh, maybe the all-time MLW champ. I don't have that in front of me, but Al Alex Hammerstone looked like a million bucks in there with Josh Alexander. 
Uh, the grizzled young vets were there. Mike Bailey was there. I mean, there's so much talent on this roster, whether it's the Trinities or the Alex Shelley's and now the former Dolph Ziggler's there. This is, if you haven't watched TNA in a while, I'm going to recommend that you go check this one out, support their program by subscribing to the, uh, well, it used to be called impact plus <clears throat> I don't know, maybe they're going to rebrand that TNA plus. I don't know, but I know it was a great show. It was well-received. And if you were looking for a control alt delete, a fresh start, that's hard to do in wrestling. You tried to do that once before with WCW. It feels like they did it here and I'm excited for, uh, the second coming of TNA, if you will. Yep. As am I, let's, uh, it's TNA is not something that, you know, I've been, had in it, nothing against them. It's just, you know, there's only so much time in a day and all that good stuff. But uh, with what's been going on lately, I'm going to, as I did last night, watching Collision because I wanted to watch Dustin Rhodes, I am going to uh, start dropping in on TNA and, and seeing what they got cooking because I'm getting a whiff and I like the smell. <laughs> I do want to talk about what you saw on Collision, but before we do, I want to mention somebody else who made a little debut over the weekend. They had a New Japan show out uh, west and we saw mustafa ali make his new japan pro wrestling debut uh, we also saw jack perry who we haven't seen since wembley stadium return to the ring but not for aw it was new japan he jumped he attacked somebody with a mask from the crowd jumped over the guardrail takes the mask off reveals who it is tears up his aew contract and then had an armband that he put on that said scapegoat. And he no longer looks like Jungle Boy. He looks like Jungle Man with a crazy beard. What do you think of Jack Perry popping back up into wrestling, but not AEW, New Japan? I think that was probably a really smart idea because of all the controversy. And, and Jack Perry didn't come out on the good end of that controversy. And, and partly because, you know, the, the involvement of CM Punk and obviously CM Punk has got a very strong and vocal fan base. So my, my guess is uh, any other decision, if they would have brought him back in Dynamite, no matter how they repackage him, it would have not been met well. Now, I guess if they're bringing him back as a heel, perhaps that would have worked in your favor. But I think at this point it was probably a good idea. I'm not so sure leading into the backstage internet drama is the best way to you know, launch your act one, but it's not the worst thing either. So let's just see what happens. Well, let's, uh, let's round out everything that happened on uh, Saturday night. You said you had a chance to check out some collision. I was shocked and surprised to see Dustin Rhodes, uh, on TV. I was thrilled to see it. He's been doing it. He announced uh, in a backstage promo 35 years. My man has found the fountain of youth, got a huge reaction. Fans are with it. It's so cool to see Dustin Rhodes doing his thing on TV in 2024. What'd you think? I would. Okay. I'm, I like Dustin. You know, we, we, we've got a long history together. And even if that were not the case, I'm always impressed with guys like Dustin who have been in the business and have, especially at Dustin's level. And still at this stage of his career uh, be able to go out there and perform at a high level to be able to enjoy something that's been the largest part of if not yeah the largest part of his life professionally or otherwise growing up in the business i i just loved it and dustin looked awesome take all my bias aside that i just admitted and be objective about it in a Dustin Rhodes, if that was a 30-year-old Dustin Rhodes, I still would have been impressed with that match. That was a great match. Yeah. It was simple. It was compelling. It was visual. It had a great pace. And that's usually, you know, one of the first telltale signs when you get somebody in the ring that hasn't been in the ring for a long time, just like anything else, right? Is you can tell that the timing isn't quite there and everything's a little bit slower and all that. I didn't get that sense at all. I didn't get that sense at all. The pace of the match, the action, the physicality, the story, the intensity. I thought it was a great match. Good, good on you, Dustin. And even more so at this stage of your career. 
they had a uh, a very special uh, overrun, I guess you'd call it. I don't know. It's back to back, right? You had your regular collision show and then you had battle of the belts. So it was an, uh, it was a double dose of AEW. That's where we would see, uh, Chris Jericho teaming up with his pal, Sammy Guevara. Sammy took one of the craziest bumps I've ever seen in wrestling off the, uh, the top of the staging there. Um, hopefully I, I know it's a controlled environment and all that. And I'm glad, I mean, I don't need to see evil Knievel, but, uh, Man, there were some crazy bumps this week on AEW. Not just the Sammy Guevara one, but did you happen to see the Darby Allen bump from Wednesday night? Yeah, that was ridiculous. I mean, that's just first of all, I hope Darby's okay, you know. But safest place, safest work environment. Come on now. Let's slow it down a little bit, folks. That's that I mean, it looked cool. But when Darby hit that rope, and I've done that. I got speared by Bill Goldberg once. I was not quite in the center of the ring. I had cheated back towards the corner just a little bit because Bill was in the opposite corner. And I wanted to give him enough room to get enough steam on it so that it looked good, right? But I went too far back. So it was my fault. It wasn't Bill's fault. But I stepped too far back into the corner, and Bill came. I mean, he... Didn't lighten up. It didn't lighten it up. It was looked good on television, but when I came down, I hit the back of my head on the lower turnbuckle, and boom! Bright flash of light and stars. And I didn't get knocked out, but I was probably as close as you can be to be knocked out. Um, and it wasn't nearly as bad as what I saw Darby do. So, man, I don't know. Scary. It was well. scary. I think we all agree. We hope that, uh, that Darby is okay, but it became apparent on that Wednesday episode of dynamite that Sting's last match is going to be sting and Darby Allen against the young bucks and the young bucks returned with uh, a different look, a different vibe. They were suited and booted and had some cool new mustaches. What'd you think of the uh, decision for Sting's last match seemingly to be Sting and Darby against the Young Bucks. I'm going to make a point here that will be relevant later on in this discussion, I'm sure. Okay. But I think Sting and Darby as a tag team are 14 and 0. And Sting is undefeated. Yeah. Okay. Well, and given their win and loss record, why aren't they getting a title shot? Okay. Now, remember that because we're going to come back to that. Um, because records matter. Wins and losses matter. Um, what do I think of that pairing? I, I think the in-ring product that we're going to see from an execution perspective is definitely going to be there. Right? I understand the four. Look, I want to be careful here because I, I don't want to say anything that can be at all inferred to be or implied to be, I would need to use that word correctly. I was corrected by a listener the other day. I saw that. Uh, yeah. I think it's cool too. I appreciate that kind of thing, but um, look, they're going to get it's visually, it's going to be a great match. It's going to come together. There'll be a lot of moving pieces. It'll, it'll take the pressure off of Sting performing with one dance partner uh, for 12, 15, 18, 20 minutes, whatever they're going to do. I get why they're doing it. It's a little bit like using a celebrity. You know, when you bring celebrities in, uh, it's a lot easier to put them in a tag and have a lot of action moving on around them to keep the crowd going and take the pressure off the talent in the ring. And not that, you know, Steve Borden certainly has forgotten more about how to perform in the ring than most people that are his peers know. Right. But still, time is what time is. I get it. The only thing that I'm curious about is what's the story, right? Other than the fact that we know it'll look good on TV. Why? Where's the why? And if they can tell me, I don't, I don't, it doesn't even have to make a ton of sense. Just a little bit of why and then keep that why building so that the match actually means something beyond Sting's last match so that it means more than just being Sting's last match with a couple of guys that can bounce around a ring. 
that's what I hope we see. So let's, uh, I'll, I'm going to take a wait and see on it. Hello. So Eric, we should, uh, move on to the uncomfortable part of the program. I suppose <sighs> I woke up on Saturday morning and was disappointed. I consider myself friends with FTR. We have, uh, had an opportunity to, so do I, by the way. Yeah, I like them. I mean, I talk to Dax on, on a pretty regular basis, somewhat regular basis. And I've been fortunate enough to help Dax and cash professionally. And, uh, that was my great honor and, and took a lot of pride in that and really appreciate their work. They're my favorite tag team. And it's not even a debate. Like I just love their old school look and feel. And I love their power and glory, uh, former finisher and who doesn't love the shatter machine. It's I like these guys and man, they were just all over you on a local interview. Uh, they were doing some uh, local media with a local station, I suppose, to promote their collision show this past Saturday in Norfolk, Virginia. And there was a, a local interviewer there by the name of Jeff Snyder, who I have to admit I was not familiar with, but he's clearly a big wrestling fan and was thrilled to be talking to FTR and Somehow, some way, my man, Eric Bischoff came up and I thought rather than us try to quote it and get it wrong, we should just play a clip. So I've got a few clips. We'll do uh, a clip from Dax here and then we'll let you <laughs> respond and then we'll do another clip. But I didn't want to get it out of context. If I've learned anything from working with you, it's that context is king. So rather than me misquote something. Let's roll that beautiful bean footage <laughs> and, and come here to this place. But also, you know, I, I don't think Tony Khan gets the credit that he deserves because he uh, afforded a lot of people, uh, a lot of jobs and a lot of income. I mean, even if you look outside of AEW, you got all these uh, old time uh, miserable podcasters like Eric Bischoff and, you know, some of the others uh, who are, who make a living just by going on, their podcasts and burying Tony and AEW when uh, they know that AEW is, is, is a place where business is thriving, um, where AEW is a place that is helping change professional wrestling for the positive. So not only did Tony give us, uh, give us and every, uh, you know, hundreds of other people a living, um, he's afforded a living to some people who otherwise would be sitting miserable, bankrupt in their house. So we'll take a pause right there. A lot to unpack there. As I like to say, um, I did find it interesting that he came out and named you specifically and not another podcaster who uh, I know he's pals with who, uh, their entire format is often just breaking down the AEW show segment by segment. Whereas at least on 83 weeks, we're trying to draw some correlations between then and now your experience in WCW, what worked and what didn't work and applying it to the present product. Maybe that was lost in translation for Dax, but I want to give you a chance to respond because I did not like that comment at all. Well, either my skin has gotten so thick that I just don't react to things the way I used to, or maybe you just get wiser with age and, and having kind of been there when I was younger, um, kind of where Dax is right now. I, so I kind of get it, you know, I mean, let's, where is Dax in, in his career? He's got to say these things. He's out there promoting his company. He's defending his company. His boss made a complete jackass of himself on social media during the week previous to this appearance he made. So I get it because what else is Dax going to do? if he doesn't have a gig in AEW. And I don't mean that as a shot because I, I like him and I, I like the tag team like you do for the same reasons. But I don't know if going back to WWE is an option. Maybe it is. You know, we've seen crazier things, right? I don't know that the, the situation where Dax left and how he left it and if he had heat or didn't have heat or, or I don't know any of that stuff. Maybe there's a chance he could go back, but eh, I think those odds are probably remote at this point. Um, so what's he got? You know, he's got the gig he's got. And and I don't disagree. Tony Khan is, 
you know, he's put a lot of money in a lot of talent's pockets. I know people personally who are making more money who have been in the business for longer than I have and are making more money than they ever have. Yes. So, so, and you know that I'm not exaggerating anything here. Yes. You don't hear anybody in AEW complaining about their paychecks. <laughs> Quite the opposite. And, and sure, that's great for talent. That's great for those individuals. And, and I'm happy for them. Just like I'm happy for somebody that wins the lottery. You know, I don't want to see anybody not get what they can get out there in the marketplace. Right. So let's dispel that, you know, because I, I agree with that. That's, I get that. It's a wonderful thing for humanity. <laughs> but it doesn't mean it's good for the business. What Tony Khan has been doing and, and some of the presentations that we've seen out of, out of AEW is not better for the business. Because it's turning off advertisers. It's turning off his own viewers. The, the audience is, is deteriorating. It's not growing. And you can talk about, yeah, but less people are watching TV and, and go back to that trope all you want. Is it a fact? Sure. Is it as an excuse? Probably not. WWE is growing in the same environment. Why isn't AEW? It's because of lack of story. It's because of lack of character development. It's because of lack of vision. And it's because of a lot of the chaos that's going on behind the scenes. Now, as far as me being old and bitter and relying upon my commentary here on 83 Weeks to stay out of bankruptcy, and presumably that's the reason why, you know, Dax is so offended by something that I said or responded to, Tony Khan on social media, that, that upset him so badly. It didn't upset him a couple of years ago. It didn't upset him at this time last year. I've been, I've been very vocal and, and my criticism of AEW and Tony Khan for a couple of years now. This is going back for at least two years, probably two and a half. It's not new. But a little over a year ago, Dax is putting it over. He loved it. Here it is right now looking for, oh, less than a year ago. Yeah. Less than a year ago. So Dax posts on January 15th of the last year, less than a year ago, very short notice, but we're, we're going to record FTR with Dax Harwood in about an hour. Starting now, we're going to do a non-wrestling question of the week. And I responded in support because I'm that way. You know, yeah. this podcasting world is a giant pie and there's enough room in it for everybody. So yeah. I like to support the people that I know and even yes. people I don't know trying to break into the business. So I responded very kindly to encourage some of my listeners to sample Dax's show. Looking forward to it. Continued success. And Dax re re responded less than a year ago. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Big fan of 83 Weeks. Weekly download on my phone. I steal a lot of your podcast formulas. But now all of a sudden, when I'm doing the same thing that I was doing, I've been doing for the last two years, he's so offended by it that he, he, he talks about me going into bankruptcy if it were not for the silliness that's a going on in TNA or excuse me, in AEW and my ability to, to have fun with it on social media. Let's just get the elephant out of the room. I wrote a book called grateful. I talked a lot about having to file chapter 11 bankruptcy. And this isn't a financial industry course, but because that's the, kind of there, right? So I, I want to address it. I'm not going to go into detail about the differences between chapter seven, Chapter 11, Chapter 13, because they're all different. Chapter 11 is a business bankruptcy, primarily. It doesn't allow me to walk away from my debts. I ended up filing a Chapter 11 bankruptcy back in 2017. I've talked on this show at length about the reasons that led up to it. Basically, me trans transitioning out of the television business. I went from making close to seven figures a year, and I took it about an 80% cut and pay over the course of 24 months. And then I had the state of California come knocking on my door and say, Hey, I know you thought you paid all your taxes, but we realize we can find a different way to tax you on business that took place out of state simply because you have a mailbox in California. That was kind of a big hit. 
none of that really matters. To protect my home, this home is my legacy. I built this home in 1998 because I really, really wanted to provide a place of stability in any situation for my family, to have a beautiful home in a beautiful part of the country from people where people from all over the world come here to visit. It's that beautiful. And I wanted to be able to leave this legacy to my children to enjoy it for the very same reasons. And when it got to the point where that legacy, this property, this home was at risk, I made a business decision to reorganize my debt, not walk away from it, not, not fulfill my obligations to it, simply to reorganize it. And that's what a chapter 11 is. Now, when I filed that chapter 11, this is back in 2017, you go through that process. And at the end of it, the court says, okay, you're going to pay back a hundred percent of this debt. Yep. And you have, in my case, five years to do it. I did it in three. I have a seven figure net worth. I have a very healthy credit score. I'm in really good shape as a result of being able to do some smart things with some help from some really smart people. So that was the context of the bankruptcy that I talked about in the book. So it's not a shot at me. I'm it is a shot. Like I said, it's in the book, right? You weren't hiding it, but I mean, he made it personal in my, in my view when he said that. And I thought, man, I got to throw the flag on that. Um, and to be clear, this podcast was hugely successful financially before AEW was even a thing. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because like, like our you success, see the numbers better than I do. <laughs> our success on 83, people who listen to this show know we have ads. Well, guess why we have ads? And I hear the complaints sometimes where we have so many ads that we started adfreeshows.com because it's successful, because people listen, because we have a smart audience who's engaged, who listen. And by the way, Dax is among them. He's admitted that he listens and stole from the podcast. Did you listen to Dax's podcast? I, I listened to clips of it. I, I didn't sit down and listen to a whole show. He's not doing that podcast anymore. Um, yeah, well, we wanted to go into that. Why, why is that? I was going to call Matt Coon and get his side of the story, but I just wasn't in the mood to chat yesterday. So, Well, there's the, there's the version that, I mean, they made a statement. There you see the, the report from Fightful where he says there was no pressure from AEW or Tony Khan to shut down the podcast. Hmm. Not what okay. I heard. All righty. And not what I heard. So, and, and, and look, I'm not Dave Meltzer. I didn't hear anything directly. I wasn't in the room. I'm not here to create rumors, to start shit. I do occasionally respond to rumors, and I do respond to shit, but I don't start shit, so I'm not going to start starting shit now. But I think it begs the question. How, what was the format of the show? Did he did he did he talk a lot about other organizations or other people, or is he just talking about wrestling? Uh, they did a little bit of everything. You know, it was a fun podcast. I enjoyed it, uh, but they did talk about AEW stuff on the podcast. And on this show, we respond to the news. That show was helping make the news. Mm. See what I mean? We've seen a lot of that lately. We are not that show. We don't want to make the news. Uh, that that's, that's not what we do now. Does what Eric say here get quoted a lot? Yes, but he's responding to someone else's report, which that just was a real head scratcher. Like, I don't know. And, and by the way, I want to, I want to circle back to something you said. I do believe that what Dax said is on the money, Tony. And I know you're going to disagree with this on some level, maybe, but maybe not hear it all the way out. Tony Khan's been a net positive to the wrestling industry. He has created a lot of jobs and a lot of opportunity and, and driven the way guys are paid up. Guys have an opportunity. WWE having a competitor, whether it's someone that is neck and neck with them or someone who's just hanging around, 
is good for the business. I don't want there to be either you work for WWE and you can make a full-time living in wrestling or you don't. So you can't, I am thrilled that there are organizations like impact and like AEW where their performers can make a full-time living in the wrestling business. And I'm thankful that Tony Khan has created that platform. I think it's a net positive. I also agree with you that with some tweaks, a few tweaks, AEW could grow. And I think that's where your approach to our podcast is maybe different from what a lot of others are saying. You want the thing to grow. You want the thing to do to be hugely successful. You have a growth mentality and growth mindset. And I think that sometimes gets lost in translation. You're not saying, I hope AEW goes out of business. Never have those words touched on this show. Yeah. I mean that, and thank you for saying that again. I'm just, I, I get exhausted seeing some of those comments. Oh, he's just a hater. He wants to fail. He's jealous. And the one that no. really makes me laugh the most is, oh, he's just upset because Tony Khan wouldn't give him a job. I thank the Lord every day that I don't have to go to work for a guy like Tony Khan. Well, you know what? Hang on now. We do have a cut. We do have a clip because there was another statement in this interview that I want you to hear. So let's play uh, another clip here from Dax. There's a, there's a couple of uh, podcasters out there that bury an AEW that, that would love a job with Tony. There's, there's one or two that wouldn't, but I know there's uh, quite a few that uh, glowingly talked about AEW initially. Um, and when Tony didn't give him a job, now all of a sudden they're talking crap about it. Uh, that'll make sense to me. So to be clear, you have appeared a few times on mm -hmm. AEW programming and, uh, there was a fun Twitter exchange that we may or may not talk about later, but I'm just curious. I, I wasn't there. I don't know. Did you call Tony Khan or anyone in AEW and say, can you get me a gig? Can you get me booked brother? Can, what happens if I just show up to the show and have my gear in my bag? Did that happen? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's never happened. And look, what, what I think Dax is referring to, and I, I talked about this on Strictly Business uh, earlier last, last week, right? What was the point? Because it was a question. It was an ask Eric anything. And the, the, the listener asked the question, when did you, when did things sour between you and Tony? And I pointed out to, to the, the listener on Strictly Business that if you go back and if you can find my tweets, and I, I don't delete them, you can go back and find anything I've posted the last couple of years. Um, Early on, very early on, I was extremely supportive of AEW. I was excited. The first episode that I watched of AEW, I was in the writer's room at WWE headquarters in Stanford, Connecticut, with six or eight writers that were on my staff at the time when we were all watching it together, and everybody was enthusiastic and excited because everybody knows at one level or another the more success there is, the more competition there is, the better things just are in any business, including professional wrestling. So the overall vibe in that room was, hey, let's see, man. Let's see if he's got something here because the anticipation was there. Right. And, and after I left WWE, I was very supportive. I think if you go back in and around the time, here's a hint if you want to look at my post. Uh, when Arthur Ashe was announced and tickets went on sale the very first time, and they sold out as quickly as they did or moved as quickly as they did. I was right there cheering them on. This could be it. This could be that next coming of WCW. I didn't say it that way, but that's what my thinking was at the time. And that's why right. I was excited because we all know fucking boats float higher. Why not? Game on. And I stayed supportive until, and I can tell you, well, I can't tell you the date, but and I think it was around November, two years ago, maybe a little over two years ago now, Tony came out and made that completely ignorant, in the literal sense of the word, comment about Ted Turner. Paraphrasing, if Ted Turner knew 1% of professional wrestling as, as I do, maybe WCW would still be around. Completely ignorant. Tony doesn't have a fucking clue what went on in WCW and why it's not around. The only thing he knows is what Dave Meltzer told him. That's it. He wasn't there. He has no idea. Um, and it was disrespectful. It was ignorant and disrespectful simultaneously. As Tony Khan's, you know, trying desperately to hang on to his television time on the on Turner Network Television and Turner 
broadcasting system, disrespecting the man that made that opportunity even an option. Right. Once someone disrespects publicly someone who I respect or I have a relationship with, they go on a different list. Doesn't mean I don't like them. I just don't have any respect for them. They're just like everybody else. I don't care if you're a trust fund baby that's a wrestling fan and has a wrestling company. I no longer have any respect for you, and I'm going to react to you just like I would anybody else. So that was it, Dax. It wasn't because I asked for a job and didn't get one. It wasn't because I was hoping I would get a job offer, and it never came. As I said before that clip, I wake up every day grateful that I don't have to work for someone like Tony Khan. Or even if I wanted to work for Tony Khan, I'm grateful that I don't have to jump on a plane every week and do it. That's or, it, more or, than anything. Or, as much as anything, for sure. Or, or put up with what has obviously been the amount of drama that's taken place backstage in, in AEW far surpasses any of the fictional drama that's taken place in the ring for the last five years. I don't want to be a part of that. Now, Dax, I understand you have to because you don't have options, but I do. Like I said, seven-figure net worth. I live in the most beautiful place in the world. I have almost no consumer debt, like nickels and dimes. It's. I have a beautiful wife. I have great kids. I have a new grandson. Everybody's healthy. Everybody's successful. I can come and go as I please. I can work with who I want on what projects I want. And I have absolutely no pressure. And I'm not saying that to brag, even though it is, and I don't mean it to be, but it's context. What I'm really grateful for Dax is I have the freedom to say whatever I want to say about whoever I want to say it about. And I don't have to worry about it affecting my income or what I want to do. Can you say the same thing, Dax? Can you? And to be clear, just put a button on that. Um, an old friend of yours called and got the ball rolling on your AEW appearance as best I can recall. We don't have to say their name. We know who they are, but as, as I recall, you got a call from a friend who said, Hey man, got an idea. Is that right? And you like that guy, you took him up on the opportunity and you made the trip. Oh, you mean to go on AEW? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, and even before that, I got Tony, you, you got Tony on our podcast to help promote something that he was doing. Absolutely. I didn't do that because I was hoping he would give me a job. No. Here's the truth. If anybody out there listening, if you're the head of a network, if you're the head of a movie studio, and you want me to come and work for you, I have to be able to do it from my home. I am not flying anywhere unless I want to. I don't like traveling anymore. Like I said, I have freedom. I'm good. There's nothing else I want. So I don't want a job from anybody. I'm self-employed and I get to do what I want to do. I have freedom. And I'm not giving that freedom up for anybody. So now there's no, I wanted a job and he didn't offer it to me. That That's kind of a Dave Meltzer, internet wrestling community kind of go-to, but it's not true. I didn't know what talking about. Oh, so we did the thing with, with Tony. I forgot where we we're going. And yes, I got a call from Chris Jericho. No, I got a call from the first one. It was Cody. I think it was either Cody or Chris. I can't remember. Hey, we Cody, have an idea. Cody wants Jericho once. Yeah. It was like, Hey, we got an idea. Can we run it by you? See if you're interested. Sure. Sounded good. I didn't even ask how much money I was going to make. Well, maybe yeah. I did. Or maybe they asked. I don't know, but it wasn't for the money. It was like, Hey, First class airfare, get to go to, to Jacksonville, hang out with some people that I haven't seen in a long time, have some fun on TV, get, get you know, bump up a little awareness for, uh, get a little FaceTime on the camera to help with 83 weeks. Hey, why not? That's it. We had a great job. Appearance. That's it. They called me. I had time on my schedule. It sounded fun. I like Cody. I like Chris. I like, you know, Keith Mitchell was there. There were a lot of people there I hadn't seen in a long time. I wanted to go say hi to. Sure. That's all it was, Dax. It wasn't me hoping I was going to get a job. I know I mean, it, he knows the truth. 
He's just doing the best he can to stay in Tony's good graces because he doesn't have the freedom that he probably wishes he did. Let's do one last uh, clip from Dax. Uh, and then I think we've got a, a comment from Cash. It's a tag team affair here on 83 Weeks. Taking them both on. It's great. There's a moment on Twitter. I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, where I was like, if Twitter were around in 1998, this is what Eric Bischoff would have tweeted at Vince McMahon or vice versa. Um, I, well, I mean, I mean, did you see the response that I gave to him? Oh, I did. <laughs> I, I mean, I that it. was, I mean, that, that's all that needs to be said, right? I mean, he went on, went on national television and, and asked for a professional wrestling match with Vince McMahon at his pay-per-view. I mean, you know, that it, it's him. It's, it's the whole calling the kettle black thing that that's that's you know that's all he's doing he's doing it for clicks he's doing it for views but also man this is uh, you know i've said it about a hundred times in this interview this is how i give my family a living this is how i put food in their mouth uh and if you're going to try to bury the place that i work and make it look less than that, that you make it personal with me i like how i like how he uses the term making it look less than <laughs> he does steal my shit that's funny <laughs> I didn't even know that. Than, different than or less than. There you go, yeah. Dax. You're learning. Keep learning. And while you're learning, learn to understand the difference in the two situations. I went head to head with Vince. Now, in all honesty, it wasn't my choice. That was Ted Turner's choice. It was just my job to do it well. Right. So we were head to head, same time, same bat channel. Well, not same bad channel, but same time, head to head. AEW, and going back to the comments I made over two years ago when I said, shut up and wrestle, Tony, that was my way of saying, focus on your own shit and quit burying WWE or comparing yourself to WWE because you're setting yourself up for an expectation you're never going to be able to deliver on. And eventually you're going to lose the goodwill of the audience that you currently have. Short way of saying it, shut up and rustle. That was the point, Dax. But it, but, but, but that behavior c continued. Um, I kind of lost myself there for a second. Well, he was talking about the whole response with Tony Khan. Oh, oh, oh okay. I'm, I'm on we'll that Sorry, sorry we'll, we'll get there in a minute on that one because I know that's a whole separate conversation. Let's put a button on the FTR discussion okay. because I guess it was time for a hot tag. And Cash came in hot. Let's take a listen to uh, Cash putting a button on this interview with Jeff Snyder to promote Collision in Norfolk. Miserable bankrupt in their house. I think he's really mad that Tony wouldn't give him a job the few times he was there to collect the paycheck. Yeah. So. yeah. You know, I've heard that before. <laughs> About yeah. comes bankruptcy number four. There's, there's, a, there's a call. Yeah. <sighs> That just feels mean spirited. It feels like a personal shot. And and, yeah, and, and, and there's also some consistency between it. Too. I wonder if they were coached. I wonder if that was a coach kind of thing. No, uh, I, I, I don't want to believe that. No, I don't want to believe it either, but it doesn't, I do find that doesn't answer the question. <laughs> I do find it interesting. You're the only person that is mentioned there. And, and I also find it interesting that he used the phrase, he showed up for a paycheck. Doesn't everybody go to <laughs> AEW for a uh, paycheck? Or maybe FTR is paying to be on the show. I don't know. Maybe they, don't maybe their deal's different, but yeah. It, 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 and by the way, it wasn't that big of a fee. So it's not, you know, it wasn't that big of a motivator for me. Like I said, it was for the fun. And I, you know, and I and I want cash up. I didn't have a gun to my head. Oh, sorry, cash. Yeah. Oh, come on now. <laughs> no, there was no gun to my head, Cash, pun intended. Um, but again, Cash is in a, kind of the same. Maybe he's in a worse situation than, than Dax because literally he's facing felony weapons charges and assault. Oh, gosh. Come on. Well, is he or isn't he? We're just doing facts here. Um, there's no innuendo. There's no rumor going on here. These are just uh, facts. Who wins with this conversation? I mean, I know he's referencing. Who wins with any of this conversation? But it's about the context. Again, going back to the same thing I pointed out with, with um, Dax, 
they're both locked into a situation that their lives is going, their lives are going to take a pretty stiff turn for the worse in all likelihood, if their relationship with AEW goes away for any reason. So of course they're going to do or come to the defense or promote or spin or whatever it is they can do for their company. And you know what? I don't even hold it against them because loyalty is a really important thing. It's one of the characteristics, human characteristics, that I put probably at the top of the list when I decide if I want to associate with somebody or become friends with somebody, or in the case of my wife, marry somebody. Loyalty is very important to me. The fact that these two guys are at least loyal to the person that they get a check from doesn't make them bad people. They're not really good at it in terms of this type of thing because they're kind of exposing themselves and. You know, you want to kind of, in a situation like this, you want your company to come out better. You want to come out better. And I don't think either one of them did, to be honest. But here or there, I, I'm not mad at them. I, I, no hard, I'm not really taking it personally. It's unfortunate, some of the things they said, because, it, again, in, in the big scheme of things, nothing they said harmed me personally or will. I'm pretty much an open book, folks. Anybody that knows me knows that. Anybody that's read my last book knows that. Anybody that's listened to me on these podcasts know that. So come on, guys. Get a little professional. Well, I hate that it happened, as I said at the top of the segment. I'm such a big fan of their work, like them personally, and I do think they could go back to WWE or impact or new Japan. Like those guys are going to have contracts in wrestling as long as they want contracts in wrestling. And when they're done, I'm sure Dax and Coon are going to be podcasting again and they'll be getting headlines everywhere, just like they were the first time. So, um, I hope that this was all just sort of lost in translation and maybe we just weren't speaking the same love language, but the best way to learn a language in immer is immersion. Living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards this year, you still can learn a language the second best way. And that's with our friends at Babbel. One in five Americans have learned a new language on their bucket list. And if that's you, make 2024 the year you finally check it off the list with Babbel. I'm such a big fan of this. I have to admit, when I went to uh, Mexico City last October, uh, to see uh, Vikingo and and how about Penta in a mask versus mask match with Viano number four? I found myself saying, I got to learn Spanish. So that is on my to do list here for 2024. I'm using Babbel, the science backed language learning app that actually works. You don't have to pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10 minute lessons are designed by over 150 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, and rooted in real life situations and delivered with real conversation based teaching. So you're ready to practice what you've learned out in the real world. What I love most about this is it's so easy. It really is an app that I can do on my own time and I can use it for like real life situations. It's easy to learn how to place an order at a restaurant, ask for directions, speak to merchants, not having to consult a language app when you're traveling abroad. It's like a little life hack and it's an app in your phone. Studies from Yale, Michigan State and others continue to prove that Babbel is just better. One study found that Babbel using it for just 15 hours is the equivalent to a full semester at college. Think about that. Babbel has already sold over 10 million subscriptions. So you know, it's the real deal. Plus all of their 14 language courses are backed by their 20 day money back guarantee. And here's a special limited time deal for our listeners to 83 weeks right now, get 55% off your Babbel subscription but only for our listeners at babble.com slash weeks. Get 55% off at babble.com slash weeks. That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com slash weeks. Rules and restrictions may apply. Eric, if you had this back in 1995, Sonny Ono would still be teaching karate. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm using Babbel to learn Spanish. 
Me too. Are you? Yeah, we're going to have a whole conversation in a few weeks. We're going to do a show in Spanish. We're going to butcher it, but we're going to get there. I love it. You know, what I, th- what I like about it is uh, it's so intuitive, right? It's kind of like the way you really learn a language. Right. Instead of like m- my grandson, Way J, Waylon James, he's now starting, he's got words down, he knows words, and he's starting to learn how to put those words together to get a response correct response and it's fascinating to watch that happens naturally and intuitively just from being a kid but since i've been looking at babel and working with babel and i just started a couple days ago by the way i've tried this once before but now i'm really committed to it i've been working on my discipline and it's working out really well but i want to learn spanish to be able to be fluent enough where if I'm in a restaurant, especially if I go to a Mexican restaurant or if I'm traveling to Mexico or outside of the country, I want to be able to at least get around and order and feel comfortable having basic conversations. Yeah. And uh, that was a great way to do it. It is so intuitive. It doesn't feel like you're studying from a book. It's interactive and you hear voices, and you hear the dialect. I love that. It's like having your own private coach. Get 55% off your subscription right now at babble.com. That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com slash weeks. So man, it feels like we're never going to stop talking about AEW because somehow, some way, uh, you wound up getting in a little bit of a Twitter spat with Tony Khan last week. Let me add some context. Context is king here on the program. For whatever reason, WWE's partners decided to start trolling Tony Khan and AEW a few weeks ago, the Jaguars put playoff tickets on sale and then against the Titans, they fell short and didn't actually wind up making the playoffs. So uh, WWE on USA, their Twitter account quote tweeted that announcement that the Jags had tickets on sale with that now iconic Kurt angle meme where he's just staring like That's not going to happen because of course the Jags aren't there. And then there was another match that was announced, uh, with, uh, the, the program Monday night, raw gender Mahal versus Seth Rollins, your pal, Raj Geary commented on social media that they had history because they had a great match at so-and-so pay-per-view in such and such year, whatever those details were. And the response again, from a WWE partner was what was the cage match rating <laughs> and that becomes a thing because it's come out that Tony Khan is really curious what fans think of the individual matches that happen on his program. And he keeps up with those ratings. Now, some people in the industry have poked fun at that. Others say, Hey man, he's getting listener feedback. He's getting viewer feedback. Anytime you can solicit feedback, that's a good thing. But there were others who met it with a chuckle. He took offense. And when Jinder Mahal was given a title shot after not getting a lot of TV time, respectfully in the last year or so, even though he is a former WWE champion and was just on TV with the rock a couple of weeks ago, Tony thought perhaps there was a double standard in the internet wrestling community <laughs> because hook has his son who has lost one time to jungle boy, Jack Perry, and then regained his FDW championship. He's only lost once in AEW. And they announced he was going to get a title shot against Samoa Joe. So Tony Khan took to Twitter to respond to that. And you quote tweeted it with the clown emoji. Not very nice of you, Eric. And then he responded with a gif, I suppose. And I think he called you. Well, it says, get out of my sight. You miserable has been, <laughs> and you quote tweet this lady from Dallas or Knott's landing or whatever the hell I'm looking at here and said, you got a thing for that style of hair. Don't you Tony? So you were having fun with this, but it did feel like Tony at least started seriously. And in the end, it felt like it was a little more lighthearted. That's the way I viewed it from my home in Huntsville, Alabama, what was really going on with that Twitter interaction with you and Tony last week? I was having a blast. I mean, I, literally it started, I, I have an infrared sauna in my studio and I do about 90 minutes a day. 
usually I do it in the mornings, but I was doing it in the evening for whatever reason. I'm looking at this stuff. That's kind of when it started is when I was in the sauna. And I was, I was, by my, I'm laughing my ass off in the sauna. It was just, it was funny. And I had a blast doing it. I think I told you the next day, man. I, and I guess I shouldn't at this stage of my life, age, but fucking with people on social media is a guilty <laughs> pleasure of mine. <laughs> What's wrong with you? I, I just, hey, if you got nothing else to do, I'm in a freaking sauna. You know, yeah. I'm in a sauna. I don't have a TV in my sauna. You know, I don't like to read in a sauna because my eyes are sweating and it's dripping down on my book or my phone or whatever. And the heat ruins the phone anyway. So I'm sitting there by myself for 90 minutes and I snuck out. I grabbed my phone. I look at it because I wanted to put some music on. And I made the mistake of going to social media and seeing this shit. And for the next 90 minutes, I'm laughing my ass off, tweeting back and forth, having a blast. It was fun for me, man. It's just fun. And by the way, so everybody knows, I was going to open this show up. I was going to get one of those big Russian Cossack cats and a big pair of goofy-ass sunglasses. And I was going to sh- open this show like Tony Khan in a scrum. Oh, but come on. Wouldn't that be good? It would have been so good. It was so good. But, you know, there were no Russian Cossack cats available anywhere in <laughs> Cody, Cody, Wyoming. And because of the weather, I didn't feel like going to Billings and looking for them. But that's what I mean. I'm having fun with this shit, bro. That's all. And I feel and, like, well, I feel like when I was a kid, my sister used to collect you. Uh, she used to have these little toys that had these, they were about this tall and they had the hair that spiked up and it came with a little brush. And I guess the story was these little mythical creatures lived under a bridge. They were the trolls and she would just comb their hair and that's you yeah. now you are yeah. a professional twitter troll if you want you know don't start none won't be none here comes eric bischoff he's gonna stir it up and have some fun and entertain it yeah and if you're gonna jump in just know we're gonna go for a ride that's all and, <laughs> and and know that i'm doing it from a perspective of love and humor <laughs> Well, th- th- if that was lost on everybody, cause it did pop off for a little bit and you had a fabulous response that I wish you wouldn't have deleted. But, uh, after he called you a has been, I think you responded with a screen grab of you coming out on AEW dynamite and the little Chiron at the bottom after it says your name and your social handle, it said groundbreaking something or other. So you responded and put a little asterisk and put groundbreaking washed up has been or whatever it was. Yeah. I didn't see that. And I, by the way, for the record, you have to be a real fucking degenerate to get me to block you. Now I mute the hell out of a lot of people just because they clog up my line or this yeah. stuff they say is so stupid. I don't, it doesn't make me laugh. Right. And I'll, I'll, you know, if it's, if it's so mean spirited or so stupid or racist or anything else like that, violent, I I'll, I'll block you. Cause I don't want to see that shit. But, you know, if it's just people criticizing me and, you know, doing what people normally do, I, like I said, I have fun with that. I don't block anybody. And like I said, unless you fall into that bucket. So I don't know where that went, but I wish I would have it because I think that's funny. I think it was, yeah. What I enjoyed most of all is the way you put a bow on the whole interaction. I don't know if it was because you were going to bed that night or what, but. I had to get out of the sauna. Okay. Well, you tweeted out something. Um. At Tony Khan, a thought on tonight's war's bittersweet end in words that echo from a bard long friend when swords are sheathed and battles cease to be a bittersweet taste lingers for all to see. Good night at 83 weeks fans. What in the world? What kind of Charles Dickens got into you? What is this? I wanted to be sure because it was clear, you know, Tony and I were going back and forth. It was kind of like a Wimbledon thing, right? It was like a tennis right. match, bing, 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 bing. And all of a sudden he got real quiet. Like he's not responding anymore. Like he ran out of shit to say. And I could tell he he was cashing in his chips, so to speak. So it was clear it was coming to an end, but I wanted to end it on a fun high note. And I've, you know, I've read a lot of Shakespeare. I've studied poetry in college. Um, I, I, I dabble, you know, in poetry quite often. So I thought I want to come up with a way that'll have that kind of Shakespearean feel, but end this on a note that will leave followers anticipating the next Twitter battle. 
Oh my gosh. No, that's what my, my intent was. Like, this was my closing act. This is the end of Nitro. This is the part of the Twitter show that gets people to tune in to our next Twitter battle. I format everything, Conrad. My life is a three <laughs> structure. Do we have to have another Twitter battle? You have to have another Twitter battle, but I wanted to end it on a high note. And I knew that, by the way, I don't read poetry. I've never read a lick of Shakespeare. I've got no interest in even trying to develop that skill set. So what did I do, Conrad? What would any thinking person do that had AI at their fingertips? Oh, I God. said, hey, Grok, or whatever it's called on, on, on X, how would Shakespeare comment on the bittersweet end of a war and that's what i got so i copied and pasted it ai can be your friend tony i want you to think tony because i know you're listening to this i want you to think hard about incorporating the gift that is ai because i believe and i've said this before discussed it before but now i'm convinced that from a creative perspective, just punch in a little bit of stuff for a for Grok. Grok will book for you. Chat GBT will book for you. You know, and you don't have to take all this abuse for putting up all this random shit and having dream matches that make no sense and people getting title shots for whatever reason and then complaining because somebody didn't use your scoring system that, by the way, you very rarely, if ever, use. If you have AI do your work for you, you've got a fresh set of, I don't know, eyes doing it. It's a thought, Tony. It's a thought. I, uh, I love that you referenced AI because you actually mentioned that on last week's 83 weeks mm -hmm. that you felt like AI could actually help with storylines, that that was a possibility in the future. And our friends over at the ringer wrestling show at ringer wrestling over on X actually did that experiment <laughs> where they took your advice in your suggestion that perhaps AI could help with pro wrestling creative. And they said, how would we put a storyline together between Randy Orton and Cody Rhodes? And it was pretty freaking good. Like I saw the clip on social, I made sure I forwarded it to you. I didn't know if you were a normal, if the ringer was normally in your, uh, digestive schedule each week, but I thought, man, this is pretty good. I'm really impressed with what they did. And I have to admit, while I was maybe a little skeptical hearing that last week from you, uh, that AI storyline between Randy Orton and Cody Rhodes, sign me up. I'm for it. And honestly, kidding aside and humor aside, I encourage people to go back and look at it. Now I reposted it because it was so, I, like you, I went, wow, that's actually good. Yeah. But in, in full context, that experiment that those guys did kicked out a three act structure because in fact, they even made a point of noting that when they kicked in their parameters, make a build a storyline between Cody and, and, um, Randy, that's it. And they kicked out act one, act two, act three, right? So they got a three act structure. They got a story built on the generational nature of both or, or status of both of the talents in a story and Dusty was involved. And I mean, look, are you going to take it right from your computer and go build a program with it? No, but it's a great way to start. A, it's a, it's a great thought starter. It gives you something tangible that's structured properly from the very beginning so that you can go in and tweak along the way and, 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 and make it yours. And I think Tony should do that, man. He should think of that. You can be cranking out storylines for ring of honor and dark and rampage and collision and dynamite not have to take any, or at least as much abuse because at least you have a three act structure. Well, I, for one am, uh, interested in in seeing how ai can affect pro wrestling in the future because i just didn't have any confidence in a storyline until i heard that clip so go out of your way check out our friends at the ringer they did a whole thing about this we'll retweet it from our official show account as well so you can see it but uh they do a good job over there and goodness gracious i'm in i i wanted to ask you about that because 
you know, we are just, uh, as you and I are recording, we're less than two weeks away from the Royal rumble. And we've got a special little top guy event that we're doing down in Tampa. It's all a part of what we're doing on adfreeshows.com. It's not the official top guy weekend. It's just a little bonus, little get together for us. We're going to have a few of those this year, or, you know, we're going to get together a few times or try. We're going to endeavor to persevere with that, if you will. But, um, there's a lot of buzz, man. What is WWE going to do with the rock? What is WWE going to do with CM Punk? And where does that leave Cody? And I've seen all the different versions of, Hey, what if this, what if that I saw Raj Geary said recently, he feels like they're trying to have Roman reigns break Hulk Hogan's title reign. And they still want to have Cody finish the story. So what if Roman retains at WrestleMania against the rock or whomever, and then he drops the title to Cody in Madison square garden, the same building where dusty thought he won the world title back in the seventies. And Ooh, that gives me goosebumps. Ooh, that's a pretty good story. I mean, I could get behind that. However, I just don't think they need the rock at WrestleMania. I know that sounds crazy. And I know you took some criticism for saying that a few weeks ago, but it seems like Tony Khan, I'm sorry, Nick Khan is borrowing pages from the NFL. And you've said that loud and proud before that the NFL, they've kind of reached a ceiling here in America. Mm -hmm. So the only way to grow that property is to grow it internationally, which is why we started to see games happen in Germany. And we've seen games happen in London and in Mexico. And now this year specifically, we're getting premium live events, quote unquote, pay-per-views in Perth, Australia, in Toronto, Canada, in Germany, in France. So we've got four international pay-per-views just this year. And the rock is a global superstar. So if what we've read online is true, that the WWE is getting a fee just for bringing the show to this country, and they're probably getting a great tax deal and a great deal on the venue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe their travel covered all that sort of thing. It makes sense that you would try to leverage a relationship with the rock to grow in those markets and help them sort of offset whatever the rocks fee might be, mm -hmm. because I would contend <clears throat> WrestleMania is going to be a huge success regardless with or without the rock. It's going to be what it is. It's not like you can sell additional pay-per-views. It's on Peacock. It's not like if you grow Peacock, they give you a bunch more money. I mean, you have a contract with Peacock. It is what it is. And once all the tickets are sold and once all the sponsorships are sold, they kind of are what they are. It would make sense to me to, Hey, let's try to continue to grow abroad. I'm saying all that to say, in a loud and clear voice, I think Cody's still the guy, and I think Cody wins the belt at WrestleMania. Let's say you. Absolutely agree. And again, talked about this a little bit on Strictly Business, talked about it a lot on Strictly Business. It seems to me that the best use of that asset being Rock, because he's yeah. a massive asset, would be better used to continue to expand or leverage him to expand in the future of the international business model, do it in Perth, S whatever the book, you know, I'm not following the creative close enough, but have, have Roman face rock in Perth, have him beat him there and then go to WrestleMania or have him beat him the night before. Like you said, yes, that will be great. But I think it would be, I don't want to say smarter because that would imply that I'm outsmarting Nick Khan. And I'm not that stupid, but it seems to be based on the information that I have, an impression I have that using Rock and Perth, if indeed the, the international expansion is the focus, would make more sense. And it keeps creatively everything intact. I, I got to think that there's going to be, hear me out. I'm not saying that I'm going to, first of all, I guess we should say, although you and I are friends with Bruce, we don't talk about any of this with Bruce. That's just not. Because we're all. friends with Bruce, we yes. don't talk about that. Correct. So I'm saying all that to say, if you recall, Cody had a, a, an incredible match last year at WrestleMania with Roman Reigns. I would argue it's a top five or at worst top 10 WrestleMania main event. As far as the in-ring work, it's been a long time since the rock 
had to work that long of a match and that sort of thing, blah, blah, blah. I'm not saying he can't do it. He's a tremendous athlete, performer, blah, blah, blah. But I am just saying it feels to me like the highest and best use of the rock might be to continue that same story. Cause if you recall at the end of last year's phenomenal match, solo Sokoa did some interference. There were some shady shenanigans that cost Cody his opportunity. And if the rock were to wrestle Roman at one of these other PLEs, maybe it's in the elimination chamber and solo Sokoa inter, uh, interfered there. And then maybe the whole bloodline gets the advantage on the rock. And then Cody makes the save or something like that. It would stand to reason that if Cody punches his ticket, because he wins the elimination chamber, whatever they're trying to do there or whatever. And he's got his title opportunity at WrestleMania again, to finish the story. If some interference were to start to happen, just like last year with solo and the rock makes the save and Cody pins Roman, but maybe it was because it was right after a rock bottom. Now we've got all kinds of rematches for these other international events. Now we can have a Roman rock match without the title online uh, on the line. That'll be huge business. We get rock at another international pay-per-view and we could also have a phenomenal match with, with, uh, Roman and Cody where Roman could say, Hey, you didn't beat me. The rock beat me. And I could see just, it sets up tons of rematches. I just believe Cody's the guy. And I think the merch tells the story for that. I think he's on all the live events that tells that like, Live event sales have never been higher. He sold more merch. All the metrics say Cody is the guy, which by the way, Cody is the guy is a new shirt available now, uh, <laughs> over at, uh, boxagimmicks.com or 83 weeks, merch.com. You can get, I'm an Eric Bischoff guy. Cody is the guy I'm back. And so much more 83 weeks, merch.com. I say Cody's the guy. And, uh, I'm excited to see what they do at the Royal rumble, but I don't think it's going to be something that involves CM Punk and Roman. I think they're going to CM Punk, Seth Rollins. I think if anybody wins the rumble, it might be punk. And he calls out, um, uh, Seth Rollins and they made event night one of WrestleMania. That would be my prediction. What's your prediction? I'm going with you. You've thought through this way more than I have, you know, and it, I, and, and, First, let me say that all of, you know, whatever the scenarios are, because you just laid out some really exciting scenarios. The last 15 minutes of this has been really kind of, what if we do this? What if they do that? Well, what right. could go this way? They, I mean, that's fun, right? Here's, here's what excites me about that conversation. Options. Anticipation. Yes. This is the part of the Sarsa formula, story, anticipation, reality, surprise, and action. The anticipation, which I think is one of the five, of the five, anticipation, I think they're all equally important, but I can't imagine anything being successful that doesn't have a lot of anticipation. And that's what you have right now, given all of the quality options that are sitting before us and sitting before Bruce and, and Paul Levesque. All of in the writers that are working with them, all of those options, any one of them creates anticipation. And that's a beautiful thing. As far as the details of it, what I prefer and what I don't prefer, this is a part where I try to help people understand. I'm not excited about the wrestling business necessarily by what happens in the ring, unless right. it relates to the business of the business. I'm more interested in the direction of the business patterns. I see business wise patterns. I see creatively, of course, because that leads to business, but I don't get caught up in the fantasy booking thing. I just don't. I, in, in the case of WWE and Cody and Roman and rock, I honestly know that there's so many great, great ways to go and options that I truly am in a, I'm just going to sit back and enjoy it mode. It's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait to uh, see what happens. We're just a few weeks away or a couple of weeks away now from the uh, Royal rumble. Less than that. The countdown is on, uh, you and I are going to have a lot of fun there with all of our ad free shows family. And now feels like a good time to remind everybody that we've got a brand new series over on ad free shows. And I know it's something you're going to really dig Eric. It's called beyond nitro. Our pal Guy Evans, the author of the fabulous Nitro book, is joining us over at adfreeshows.com for a new exclusive monthly series. 
Beyond Nitro will feature in-depth, exclusive, long-form articles, each expanding upon many of the key elements, themes, and stories discussed in the Nitro book. Maybe reading's not your thing. Well, each piece will also be narrated by Guy and available in both audio and video form. On the debut episode, Guy's going to examine what we all love so much, wrestling nostalgia. Why has fans' interest in the Monday Night Wars lasted for so long? Will there be the same level of interest 20 years from now relative to today's wrestling? What's changed? What hasn't changed? And why does it matter? Check out Beyond Nitro this January exclusively on adfreeshows.com. And of course, when you join at adfreeshows.com, not only do you get to hear the shows early and ad-free, you get to be a part of our live studio audience, including some folks who joined us this morning. How about PJ Taints? What a name. He's here in our studio this morning, along with Jeff Hayes and a lot of other folks. Shout out to uh, Mike Coop and JB and uh, Coach Keith. There's a lot of folks hanging out in the group chat. Little Jimmy Sorensen's here. Anthony's here. Greatly appreciate you guys showing up early on a Sunday morning to hang out. Appreciate you, Aaron, and so many others who decided to join us for our live studio audience this morning. Denovius Max in the house. Uh, we appreciate all the support. Not only do you get to be a part of the live recordings, you get bonus content from each of my podcasts that we actually host here. One new piece of bonus content every single month, and it's always with the host. So Arn Anderson will come on. Kurt Angle will come on. The Road Dog will come on. You get to be on camera, ask these guys your questions, do a piece of bonus content. It is a fantastic opportunity for you to sign up and get more of what you really enjoy, this nostalgia of professional wrestling we love so much. One of my favorite series is called The Book. It's with David Crockett, and we take his brother's red book from the fantastic booking mind of Dusty Rhodes and the excellent penmanship of J.J. Dillon. We break down every month, every week, every day, every show, including The Gate. We're talking dollars and cents. And, of course, we add a little context to what's going on with the business with a member of Wrestling Royalty, Mr. David Crockett. So to actually see the actual booking sheets from those days, is an excellent trip down memory lane. We just wrapped up 1985. We're getting 1986 kicked off this month. Make plans to join us over at adfreeshows.com. So Eric, let's talk about uh, some other news and notes and, and, and more specifically, maybe drawing some parallels between AEW and WCW. When All Elite Wrestling launched, it was on TNT, of course, with Dynamite, and it was just two hours a week. And they started to do other tapings, things like dark and elevation where those were really YouTube shows, but nobody respectfully paid all that much attention to them, but it was important to get guys reps and get people an opportunity to get familiar with the AEW audience, super serve that insatiable AEW audience at times and just reps for their performers. But it starts as a, a two hour program. And with the expansion of media rights, which is something that WCW never participated in because they were a television company, the goal was to provide more content. So with the success of Dynamite comes more money and more TV time requested. So we launch in 2021 Rampage. So now we've got a second show, a third hour. And this is all under the Warner Brothers Discovery banner. They recently put out a press release sort of touting the success Warner Brothers did. So that's got to be a good sign for AEW folks. But Nitro eventually, and I guess I should mention, you had Saturday night. Saturday night was there before Nitro was there. Mm -hmm. The syndicated shows like Pro and Main Event, they were there before Nitro was there. But when you added in Thunder, man, you were dead set against it, according to your book. And you felt like it might dilute the actual show. And I'm wondering now, as we've passed the six month mark of collision, do you think that collision has perhaps had a similar effect on dynamite the same way Thunder did on nitro? Or is there any parallel that can be drawn at all? No, I think there's a lot of parallels, you know, and if you go back, you and I talked about this when it was announced that, you know, AEW, and this is why I was still very supportive. So this, this perspective that I'm going back now on is the comments I made is probably five years old, right? Um, 
my perspective then was don't, don't do it, Tony. I know there's reasons to do it. There's always a reason to do something you want to do. If I want to, if I want to do something stupid, I can justify it anyway in a million different ways and make it sound good to myself. <laughs> it's a bad habit, but until, and I, I was critical of it. I said, I think it's a mistake based on my experience. It was a mistake because you not only, in, in the case of WCW, I was worried about dilution, saturating the product. There's only so much time in everyone's lives for your product, whatever it is. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I watched a series, uh, Lori and I started a series the other night called Hijacked. Phenomenal series. Phenomenal storytelling. A lot of great things about the show. Hijack. Check it out. But I can only watch an hour of it at a time. I can't sit and watch something for four or five hours. Or if it's a longer series and maybe there's six, eight, ten seasons, I'm not going to watch two or three hours of anything, no matter how much I love it every night or even once a week. Right? So my concern with, with WCW became Nitro and Thunder was about just audience fatigue. How much more wrestling will my audience make time for? And then as you think through that, you realize that there are probably some that are going to a large percentage that are going to go, you know what? I'm just not going to watch four hours of wrestling in prime time. My wife will divorce me. My kids will leave, whatever. My dog will piss on the floor, whatever. You know, you're spending too much time doing watching wrestling. Um, you know you're going to lose some of that. So which one are they going to pick? And at, at the end of the day, there's audience fatigue. But the real problem, and this is what concerned me the most five years ago with AEW, which has kind of borne out to be true, I guess, is that in doing these different shows for whatever justifications may exist, you're not only diluting the product on television, but you're diluting your resources, your creative resources. Because you've got a young company five years ago, everybody's learning on the job, creating, writing, producing, and executing great wrestling is a difficult job. Made more so when the people doing it have no real experience. Right. And have to learn as they go. And then to dump other obligations and expose your product to the audience when you don't have the experience, the infrastructure, the staff, or the vision creatively, and now you're dumping more pressure on you, we're seeing how that's playing out. Had Tony waited, in my opinion, this is not a fact, this is just me, having been there and done that, and having had tremendous success and some pretty abysmal failures along the way. I have the unique perspective of looking at things from both angles, objectively. I don't weigh one over the other. I think they're both equally valuable when it comes to those two perspectives, from success and from lack thereof. And my opinion back then was don't do it yet. Make your core brand healthy and stand on its own, even if it means saying not yet to your broadcast partner, because they don't want you to fail. Even though they say, we want another show, you can say no. I didn't. Here's that mistake category. I right. didn't. Because I was working for the guy that said he wanted more. I didn't have the option of saying no. Perhaps. We'll never know. But I didn't. And the result was the result. I just, so, it, I really, I, don't know I, really I hope your critics listen. Because I, I mean, I know that there's a lot of people who've decided that they don't like you and they don't like this program without ever actually listening. They just read a clickbait headline here or there somewhere. But that's what we've been saying from the beginning. You're uniquely qualified to talk about the successes and the failures. And you saw what got WCW hot and you saw what ultimately saw WCW circle the drain. And so when I feel like people are and I don't know. I feel like I take it more personally than you do sometimes, but when people are just dragging you through the mud and saying, Oh, he killed two promotions. Hey, muck or father WCW had never had a profit before Eric Bischoff. And let's make a list of all the promoters who went head to head and tried to fight Vince McMahon 
and, and show me where anybody beat him once, whether it was Bill Watts, uh, or it was the Grams, or it was Vern or, or Don Owen or the Crockett's. I mean, just make a list. They all lost. Only one guy had Vince on his heels and he beat him over a hundred times, but 83 times in a row. That's the reason we named the show that, but just to remind people who Eric is and not this bullshit narrative that, oh, he bankrupted two companies. Bitch, it was already bankrupt when he got there. Neither one of them had ever turned to profit. What are you talking about? He got wrestling hotter than ever because he did something different and he can come on this program and say, oh, I don't know if I would do that. And you should listen because he saw what worked. And more importantly, he saw what didn't work. But instead, it's this gotcha thing like, well, in the end, his didn't work out. Who's did, Muckerfather? Who's <laughs> did? Eric's did for a little while. Nobody else's did at all, ever, in the history of time and space. And I just love when you get on here and you're like, hey, and when I got thunder, and here's a failure, I didn't say no because I couldn't say no. I just think that's that makes you an evolved human being, Eric. And I hope that your critics will listen to that and understand that you are perhaps the only person qualified to comment on this sort of thing. Well, thank you for that. And and again, the the criticism or the perspective is from that position of not I've I've never come at any situation or conversation or question or challenge. Well, I did this and I proved that I was right. No, brother. I mean, I've, I've, I've had some great success. I've had some, as I said, abysmal failures and I've had a lot of stuff in between and right. to be able to kind of have a, a analytical layer over my perspective that allows me to kind of break down what led to the success and what led to the failures or mistakes or bad choices is fun for me to talk about. And I don't, it is it, it it is frustrating when you hear that narrative. You know, I didn't run TNA. I expressly demanded in my contract with TNA from day one that I not be an employee or have anything to do with the operations of the business. But yet, according to some, I bankrupted TNA. You know, and by the way, WCW never filed for bankruptcy, right? Jimmy Kellner made it. TNA still going. Nothing was bankrupted. Yeah. So this this you know. Dex Harwood narrative and the bullshit out there. It, it, it is frustrating, but I, you know, I don't really care. I'm going to keep doing what I do. Doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm having fun. You know, it's all that matters to me. And I'll tell you what else you're having fun with. And that's our friends at magic spoon. You and I have been such a big believer in this. Uh, if you are looking to have some new year's resolutions to eat better, and maybe you're trying to make some gradual changes. And maybe you don't want to have one of those bland breakfast cereals. You know what I'm talking about, where it feels like it's medicine more than the stuff you grew up on. Well, how about trying magic spoon? They've reinvented your favorite childhood cereals to taste great, but each serving has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and like only four to five grams of net carbs per serving. They're also wholesome. They're keto friendly. They're gluten free. They're grain free. They're soy free. And it's a way to relive those moments when you were watching your favorite cartoons or Saturday and Sunday morning wrestling, but it's only 140 calories a serving. And they've got something for everybody. Check out all these flavors, man. Cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, uh, blueberry muffin, maple waffle, honey nut, birthday cake, chocolate chip cookie, and cinnamon roll. And I'm sure some of those flavors make you think of your favorite childhood cereals. That's by design. Our pal here on the show, Dave Silva, the third man on the program. He likes to mix together the cocoa and the peanut butter. He calls it peanut butter cup. I don't know why he says it so fast, but he does. Arn Anderson loves maple waffle. You will find exactly what you're looking for. Magic Spoon also offers treats, which are the perfect on the go snack. They're like the marshmallow treats you had as a kid. You know the ones, but only one gram of sugar and one to two grams of net carbs. And they're packed with 11 grams of proteins per bar. My wife has absolutely worn it out. She loves these marshmallow treats. You know what we're talking about. They come in two flavors, marshmallow and chocolatey peanut butter. I think you're going to love it. I know I do. And uh, it's a treat for my wife and I every weekend. Magic Spoon is the way to go. It is a guilty pleasure without the guilt. I want to reiterate, zero grams of sugar. 
13 to 14 grams of protein and only four to five grams of net carbs per serving. It's only like 140 calories a serving. This is a snack you can feel good about in the new year. And let's not make that change so drastic. Let's have a little fun with Magic Spoon. Head over right now to magicspoon.com slash 83 weeks to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try the magic for yourself. And don't forget to add their delicious treats for the on the go snack. Be sure to use our promo code 83 weeks at checkout and you'll save an extra $5 off your order. By the way, Magic Spoon, man, they're so confident in their product. It's backed with, check this, a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, start the new year off right with a delicious bowl of high-protein cereal at magicspoon.com slash 83 weeks and use the code 83 weeks to save $5 off. We want to thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring today's episode and a damn tasty breakfast, if I do say so myself. So let's jump back into it. Uh, we know that you're diluting the product a little bit and, and at the end of WCW because you started with a, a two-hour Nitro. Now you've got a three-hour Nitro. Now you've got two hours for Thunder. You've got two hours for Saturday night. You've got syndication, plus you've got a three-hour pay-per-view every month. And there's so much competition. Monday Night Raw, eventually SmackDown, and of course ECW's on TV. Man, the late 90s, there was a lot of wrestling content on television. Yeah, you know, I, it's easy to forget until you look at a graphic like that, you know, because we look at everything that's going on now, and there's, you know, there's TNA, and there's, you know, what is it? The Women's Wrestling Organization out of LA, which, by the way, is kind of doing, it's interesting to follow them, too, in syndication. Wow. Um, Wow. Yeah. Um, you've got new Japan, you've got so much stuff going on, obviously AEW and WWE, but yeah, we had a similar kind of situation back then, just higher level, more network stuff, more cable stuff and less obscure stuff. Do you feel like with the benefit of hindsight that the quality of nitro dropped because of thunder? I mean, I know that you signed more performers and we've talked about that before guys like Mikey Whipwreck and some of the other ECW talent that you would bring in or because you knew that you had this new show that you were going to be booking. So guys like Marty Jannetty would get another look and all of a sudden Rick Martell was back. And I'm excited that all those guys got an opportunity and got a payday and yada, yada, yada. I think, all that's great. but I am curious the stress that it put on the team behind the scenes whether it was the production people, the riggers, the truck drivers, the people who set the ring up, but then just creatively, like it's one thing to have to come up with. And I just want to take a time out for a minute and just talk about regular TV. Some of your favorite TV shows that you still love and celebrate all these years later, like right now is the 25 year anniversary of the Sopranos. Most of those seasons had 13 episodes. Some, some seasons would have 10 episodes of your favorite TV show. Some would, might even have like eight, but we're talking about in a 13 episode season, 13 hours of content that we're going to put out once a year. So with nitro being two hours, you're already starting with not 13 hours this year of content we've got to create, but 104 hours. Now we add a third hour. We had another 52 hours and oh, you know what? Now they want thunder. Let's add another 104. Like eventually bankruptcy has been a big word today. You start to be creatively bankrupt a little bit. Do you not? I mean, that's the biggest issue. You can hire more production staff. Yes. You can put an ad in a paper and do that. Right. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. You can find, you can find more highly qualified people in the marketplace to, to add to your labor pool, your staff. You can hire more wrestling talent. I did that. The intellectual property side of it, the, the, the mental horsepower, the creative horsepower, that's where it becomes difficult, in my opinion. And in my experience, it's not my opinion. It's my opinion based on experience, not only in WCW, but as a talent in WWE and as the director of SmackDown in WWE. The same challenges existed. And I'm sure they exist to this day at some level. If you don't have two separate 
fully functional, finely tuned, proven creative teams that can focus only on their stories and their arcs for their respective shows. You cannot help but to convolute, dilute, and, and, and do damage to your creative process. It's weird math, and I don't know if it's true, but it was for me. You've got a three-hour show over here on Nitro, which was, you know, that was mentally tough anyway, creatively tough to hold an audience for three hours is fucking ridiculous, but whatever. That was the job. Now you add another two hours. Now you got a great creative team. If you go back and look at those ratings, you look at the success critically or otherwise, you look at the revenues, you look at any metrics you want to look at. During that period of time, WCW was rocking and rolling. We were almost printing money. Throw thunder into the mix. Now what happens? And you can point fingers creatively and you can sit on the sidelines and do your Dave Meltzer bullshit and dirt cheat bullshit and come up with all your reasons why based on your vast experience of having been there and done it. Well, I'm sorry, not as to why things turned out the way they did. That's the internet narrative. From my perspective, as an operator, as the guy who is overseeing the process and trying to create it, it's like if, if you need 100 pounds of creative weight in order to be successful driving that three-hour show, Nitro, now you get another show in prime time. The weight on that creative team doesn't double. It almost triples. That's where the collapse happens. That's why you need to have two proven, functional, provable creative teams focusing on nothing but their respective shows in order to stand a chance. Otherwise, if you've got one team trying to do both, Right. You've got, you're, you're on a path to, to disaster. Eventually it may take, may take six months, may take six years, but you're going to crash and burn. It's just not possible. You can't keep up. You can't be, nobody's that good. Nobody's that good. Of course, the big difference between then and now, I mean, this is something we should discuss because you were sort of dictated to because WCW was owned by a television company. So there wasn't a function of, Hey guys, we're trying to grow our business. Let's see if we can sell another show. And after your wrestling life was over, you did go sell shows and you did quite well during that, but this is a different circumstance. You're not selling another show you're not creating more revenue you're just being dictated to that you got to do it now conversely these days a lot of people would say tony khan in the 2023 2024 landscape the the biggest revenue item for wwe or or, or aw or any wrestling company is that rights fee gone are the days of we make the most of our money on pay-per-view we make most of our money on ticket sales and touring house shows Rights fees are sort of the standard and wrestling, as you've pointed out several times here on the program, compared to another type of television programming is pretty affordable to produce. It's still expensive, but compared to a drama where they spend a year to create 13 episodes, this is a little easier to produce and it can have a more consistent audience. Because when you're spinning up a new show and you're hoping it builds an audience and it gains some steam, it runs for 13 weeks and then it's off the air until a year from now. And now you've got to just repeat this cycle. So understanding all that I think is important as a wrestling fan. He's probably feeling the pressure to super serve his television partner because he wants to get a bigger deal the next time around. It's a slippery slope because it feels like if you're not growing, you're dying in business a lot of times. So I'm sure when given the opportunity to perhaps get this other hour of television and maybe spin up another brand, because we saw, for instance, you know, SmackDown was, was firmly the second tier brand. Raw was the A show for decades. But when SmackDown went to Fox, SmackDown became the A show. 
and raw became the B show. And now that SmackDown is leaving Fox and they're going to USA raw's looking for a home. So all of a sudden it feels like SmackDown is still the A show. And that became the show that USA wants. Do you see a scenario where as AEW is continuing to try to grow that they too don't have all their eggs in one basket and they're trying to have this show with this platform and this show with that platform from a business strategy standpoint, Nick Khan probably can't get all the money he wants for both raw and SmackDown out of one party. He needs two separate. I mean, that's good for business. Do you think that's the angle that Tony will approach as he looks to renew collision and dynamite? I, I would hope he would at least consider it. You know, the difference is WWE with raw and SmackDown have considerable leverage. AEW doesn't. And I'm talking just from a purely performance perspective. Um, and, and, and another thing that never gets discussed because none of us have access to the information. It's not because anybody's hiding anything. But until you have a complete picture of the ad sales success of any program, SmackDown, Raw, Dynamite, Collision, whatever, if you don't have some visibility into the economics from a network perspective of how those ads are performing, it doesn't matter what the ratings are. Kids, it doesn't matter what the demos are. Kids, if you can't sell advertising in the show because it's just not a show people want to be in, it's what's called a make good destination. Meaning you are there, your content, you're filling time, but they're just taking previous other commitment, other commitments that have nothing to do with your show and trying to fulfill them with the eyeballs your show delivers. That's not ideal. That is not an ideal situation. Conversely, if you have a show that has viable advertising clients that are interested and committed and spend money in your show because they like your show and the results that it perform or it gets and the audience that makes up its demographics, it almost the same is true. The ratings become less relevant if the cost per thousands with regard to the advertising rates that the network's getting are sufficient or exceed other programming. So, so much depends on how you're doing with the advertising rates and, and how ad sales likes you. If you're hard to sell, it doesn't matter if you're AEW, what your ratings are, what the PR, what the press release says. That's all spin. Anybody that's hanging their heads on a press release is obviously never been in the industry. It's just exactly what it says. Public relations, not a business statement. Yeah. It's not a business indicator. Yeah. I, um, I've said it before here on the program, but I think one of the, you know, again, I know it's no longer a startup, you know, we're five years in at this point, but it's still a young company and infrastructure is still something they're adding. Like we just saw the announcement last week. It was made uh, public that they've hired a new COO. And I think the more of that infrastructure they add, obviously that's great for AEW. But one of the things I, I hope that they're working on it, because I don't have any inside knowledge is a sales team. Because I know for sure WWE has had an ad sales team forever. And if you watch the program, and I don't know this for sure, but it feels like they have two AEW specific sales on that program. The insurance company, State Farm and DraftKings. Outside of that, it looks like it's just like Turner sort of run of site ads where I'm just buying whatever's on TNT on Wednesday at eight o'clock or whatever. Um, I'm curious from your perspective, do you think a key to this next round of television rights negotiations is going to be what sponsors Tony knows he's got, regardless of where he is? Like when we go to so-and-so, I know I got this one in my back pocket. They're going with me. That's important. Is it not? It is. And I think that, I mean, it, it, it comes down to what we were just talking about. You know, you're, you're, your ability to bring ad sales specifically yeah. to your program is key in any business decision as it relates to a network because that's how they make their money. Yes. That's it. It's just, they've got the beachfront property. They've got a beautiful piece of vacant property. They want to make money with that property. And the only money that they can make with that pot property is by putting a temporary house on it and charging rent for it or a license fee. But if, that piece of, if that house that's on that beautiful piece of beachfront property called prime time 
no one wants to rent it or they'll only spend Airbnb money on it at the last minute because there's nothing else available. That's not the house you want on that piece of property. So you move that house somewhere else or just build another house. That's where, that's where I think dynamite is at. And that's why ad sales. And again, you know, when I watch, when I do watch wrestling, because I'm not watching for necessarily the action in the ring, although I'm entertained by it, don't get me wrong, but that's not why I'm turning it on. I'll watch two things first before I even, even pay attention to who's in the ring. I'm watching the reaction from the crowd in any given moment. And I'm watching for the advertisers. So I've said many times, I look at patterns. I don't necessarily look at the image in front of me. I look at patterns behind it. And you, I can at least convince myself, but I'm right more often than I'm wrong, by the advertisers within a program, how well that program is doing. Let me give you an extreme example. Yellowstone, when it was hot, every single advertiser that was targeting that male 18 yes. to 49 Dodge truck, Coors Light, testosterone, yes. cowboy, tough guy bullshit was spending buco bucks inside of that show. That was a destination for ad agencies. They were fighting for an opportunity to advertise in that show. Now yeah, that's an extreme, but the same principle is true in wrestling. And it's the degree to which you can bring advertisers to your show because you're comfortable with it. And that's where having your own sales team, to your point, as I go through this long winded way of saying, good idea, Conrad, but having your own sales team is critically important. And I'll tell you what, going back to WCW, WCW had an ad sales team based in New York. They were very successful. For, they, they sold all of the Turner Broadcasting inventory across all of the networks, including WCW. But WCW was so unique that those ad salespeople who had no other relationship with WCW, they didn't watch wrestling, they didn't like wrestling, they knew nothing about wrestling, blah, 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 blah. It was just in the Turner bag of tricks to try to sell. How hard do you think they tried to sell it? Same thing is true, by the way, I'm sure, for WWE. When you have the network side driving the ad sales, but those network salespeople are human beings, they don't know everything about everything. They don't know the best way to position or sell certain shows or the audience that comes with them. WWE has learned the value of that over decades and decades and decades, which is why they have such a great sales team because they knew they needed one. That's what Tony needs. Because selling wrestling is different than selling a sitcom or selling a drama or selling animation. Those things are easy to sell. They, in some ways, sell themselves based on their pricing in the marketplace and their performance in terms of ratings. It's not a tough sell. People are buying numbers. That's the other thing. You know, media buyers are not buying emotion. They're not buying the fact that AEW and, you know, they listen to Dax on his podcast and he supplies a lot of people with a way to make a living. Those are all good things. I don't mean to sound disparaging towards that comment, but I am because none of that fucking shit matters. Advertisers don't care. Yeah. They don't care. They're making yeah. non-emotional decisions based on math. Yeah. And that's what Tony needs to do. And if they've only got two advertisers regularly, they need to beef that up. They need to. And the only way to do that is by having a dedicated team that is passionate about your product, knows your product inside out, knows how to overcome objections to your product, your, your, your project or your product, because they know it intimately and the unique aspects of what the unique viewer that loves wrestling brings to the table. So if you don't have somebody there to communicate that and use that knowledge and passion to overcome the standard objection, which is wrestling, why would I want to advertise in wrestling? You got to be able to answer that. Your corporate network salesperson won't, unless there's a story there, unless there's math there they can point to. That's easy. But if it's not easy and it's hard because you're new or you're growing or you're young, you need somebody that's dedicated to it. I just want to point out too, you know, I think everybody knows this, but I just want to remind everybody the first nitro 
It's like Labor Day 95. And Nitro was done in March of 2001. So we're about the point in time where Nitro started to uh, peter out a little bit relative to the first dynamite to now. So just timeline wise, like brawl out, wouldn't be too far away from where the finger poke of doom was relative to nitro at the time. Do you think that, you know, I mean, I just think nitro was so important. I mean, clearly even like the logo for collision was loosely based on dynamite. I mean, that, that can't be disputed. Um, I'm not dynamite, but nitro. And I mean, even the name dynamite, it's so close to nitro. Clearly we're leaning on that, but it had such a big, it left such a big impression in a relative short amount of time. And I know that you have talked about before that you could feel the winds of change and, you know, the writing was on the wall sort of thing. How, how important do you think the timing of some sort of quote unquote creative turnaround is for AW because you've been pretty critical of their creative. And I know that with the, with the benefit of hindsight, this is around the same time years wise where fans started to get a little frustrated with dynamite or nitro's creative as well. So very true. I didn't have thought about it from a timeline perspective, but that's true. Isn't it? I mean, so I, just saying loosely 95 to 99, and now, you know, here we are late 2018 or late 2019 to now. It feels close. Feels close. And and I do look, social media isn't real. I mean, it's yeah. it's a, it's a small snapshot into a small part of an overall reality. It's mm -hmm. it's 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 not the barometer by which I judge anything, to be honest. Um so I, you know, the the negative, you know, the velocity of, of negative comments that I'm hearing about AEW creative that that's not related to anything that I say or do on social media. I'm just talking about stuff that's floating around out there, the stuff you see on the news sites and, and reading the comments, which I do, you know, is, you know, I see something posted, whether it has something to do with me or not, I check those comments. And in the beginning, and this goes back to the goodwill that I talked about when I first started supporting W or AEW, because they had so much goodwill. Everybody was, hell, WWE writers in the room that were watching the premiere episode with me were cheering them on. That was just, everybody was so excited. And that has value. That goodwill has value. But you can wear it out. How many times have you heard me quote Gary Considine, former executive producer for The Tonight Show with Jay Leno at NBC, when he said to me, Eric, once the audience decides to vote with their remote, it's almost impossible to get them back. And what I'm seeing in terms of ratings, in terms of ticket sales to, to taping or to productions of Dynamite and Collision and all that, you're losing the goodwill. The yeah. audience is voting with their remote and they're voting with their pocketbooks and they're losing ground. So I think it's critical Whatever Tony's doing, and people could take this any way they want. I really, really, really have so no fucks to give. But if I was Tony and I wasn't feeling secure in my renewal position or negotiation position, I'd be cutting back on content and beefing up my creative and coming to those meetings with a plan of how this business is, how I'm going to grow my audience. I would bring that into the negotiation. Because the trajectory we're on, the trajectory that they're on right now is a, a beach house, a beautiful piece of property, and the foundation is cracking, the house is starting to tilt, it hasn't collapsed yet, but fewer and fewer people are interested in renting that piece of property, or in this case, watching that property. Not good. Beef up creative, Tony. Learn how to use AI. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you something you and I learned how to do, and that's get an affiliate partnership with fanatics in the WWE shop. It's an easy way to support one of your favorite podcasts. You can shop for official WWE gear and apparel by using this special URL shop wrestling merch.com that's shop wrestling merch.com. They've got replica title belts, of course, NWO t-shirts, 
you got hoodies and tumblers and oh my everything wwe sales pretty much is available at shopwrestlingmerch.com now it's the same great price as you've always enjoyed from fanatics but this way it actually helps support the show it doesn't cost you anything extra so if you're watching along with us on youtube just hit the qr code that's up on your screen right now or if you're listening just check out the link in the description for this episode but at shopwrestlingmerch.com you can shop with confidence for your favorite wwe superstar tees hoodies caps belts and more all with wwe shop but be sure to use our special link shopwrestlingmerch.com to support the show speaking of wwe superstars a part of our live studio audience mr jimmy Sorensen, wants to know do you think mjf is still in aew or is he wwe bound there's been lots of rumor and innuendo about mjf's contract and is he going is he not there's been other speculation while well, andrade is no longer with aew and he's canceled some independent bookings will we see him come back and what about sasha where is she gonna land and is trinity finishing up with impact is she headed back at the royal rumble do you have a read on any of these talents and we'll start first with mjf certainly i don't have a read on anything so let's you know i'll just play a game uh, with myself I, I think mjf is really really smart i think he's probably as good of a businessman intuitively as he is on the mic he's inexperienced he's young but i just have a lot of faith in his critical thinking process so my guess would be he stays because the more of these big names that go the more valuable he becomes. Now, if he's going to make an emotional decision, that will be different because he's frustrated or, or emotionally, perhaps he gets a little greedy and thinks that uh, I can make a little more money over there or whatever. But if I'm a smart guy like MJF and I'm seeing all these big names who came in with all this promise and hope and going to change the wrestling world and a shocking surprise that absolutely achieved nothing because primarily they weren't given the opportunity. It's not their fault. It is what it is. But if I'm MJF, I'm staying put and I'm raising my price or enjoying the benefit of being the focus of the company. Yes, there you go. I, I think it's really, really crowded at the top right now in WWE with potentially rock being involved. And we know Cody's there and punks there and Romans there. And Oh, did we mention Seth Rollins and Randy Orton and, and, and an LA Knight? here he comes and why not keep doing what you're doing? If you're MJF, that's what I would expect to see happen. A lot of people wondering about mercedes monet mike hoop who's watching along with us says a lot of speculation on sasha banks showing up in aew but do you think it'll be more likely she shows back up in wwe or tna now the tna question comes up because allegedly according to the rumor and innuendo that was her and those hat and glasses sitting next to what looked like bailey watching the tna pay-per-view where they saw jordan grace and um trinity fatu to absolutely tear it up what do you think do you think we see mercedes monet in aew wwe or tna not even a guess not not even a guess i have no i don't think i've ever had a syllable of conversation with her i don't know what she's thinking I only know what I read, which is very little because I'm not paying attention to her, but she evidently had a meeting with WWE, started negotiating. It didn't go well. Um, that was a bad but, sign. It, did it not go well or did we just hear it didn't go well? Well, that's what we heard. As I said, I don't know. I'm just yeah. you know reading you know bullshit on the on the internet. I, I know zero. So I, I don't know. I don't know her motivation. If she, I mean, she's going to make more money and have more success in WWE. There's no question about that. So from a financial point of view, it's a WWE move. Now, is there shit going on backstage or relationship wise? Is there political baggage there that is clouding the picture? I don't know. Um, but if I'm, if I'm her or if I'm her agent or business manager, 
I'm, I'm going to try to go to WWE because that's where she's going to make the largest amount of money. And they also have to think, <clears throat> much like Jay Cargo, I don't know. I've never talked to her either, obviously. But, you know, you get these young female or, or male talents that are emerging and negotiating. Do you want to work for a company that's owned in part or, or owns, I should say, Endeavor, one of the largest media agencies in, in, in the world, where you have an opportunity to perhaps expand your performance career long after your wrestling career is over? Mm -hmm. Can you work your way into movies like John Cena or or Batista or obviously The Rock? And because working in a company that is owned or owns Endeavor provides you with a lot better, at least, window into some of those opportunities. But it all depends on a talent's goals and whether they're thinking critically long term or emotionally short term. Let's, um, you know, I don't know that she'll make the most money with WWE. I think Sasha could make more money with AEW, but I, I don't think that it can be debated that if you want to be a bigger star on a, not just in the wrestling bubble, WWE is more likely to make you a bigger star in the real world. Uh, than the AEW system would at this point, but you could still get a great quality of life and perhaps more money and probably more money per appearance in AEW. That's oh, yeah, no, you, look, look, you can go to the Dax Harwood, you know, Tony Khan, you know, AEW ATM machine. Cause I think clearly now Tony Khan has taken that title from me and I, and I'm glad to share it with him or I just give it to him. But could she, you know, could Tony in whatever state of mind Tony happens to be in at any given moment go, I'm really ready to buy you know, the, the, all these services and I'm going to spend whatever. I'm going to out, I'm going to outbid for her services because I can, because I'm a trust fund baby and I don't have to account to anybody or actually make any money. Stop so saying she that. could write it. I know that was a shot. I'm sorry. That, that not really, but. Could she make more money with Tony? Yes. But her career as a star is effectively over at that point. And if, if you don't agree, not you, but if one doesn't agree with that statement, look at any other quote unquote, former WWE star that is better off today than they were at the peak of their careers in WWE. I'm not talking about the guys who were on their way out the door or the guys that really, you know, hadn't been used very often. I'm talking about people that were at their peak of their careers in WWE. They make that move to AEW. Their career is not what it was. It's the end of the road. But if the end of the road comes with a big old fat paycheck so you don't need any more road, I'd be right there with you. I'd do the same thing. Well, let's say this. I do think they've done a great job with Sting. I think AEW's done a much better job with Sting than WWE did. He's got that undefeated streak. We talked about his tag match at the, at the top of the show. It looks like that show is going to sell out. I would imagine that they would open up even more tickets, production kills and whatnot, and continue to sell more and more tickets. Uh, they're over 15,000 at this point. Who knows where it'll stop? Uh, another question from Jimmy here. He wants to know, did you watch SmackDown this last Friday? And do you believe it further heightened the suspense to the pay-per-view Royal Rumble? See you in Florida. Did you watch SmackDown? I did not. Hey, Jimmy, how are you? I look forward to seeing you there. Obviously, we're going to have some fun. But uh, no, I did not. I, I, I don't know what I was doing Friday night. I'll be freezing my ass off somewhere. I know what you were doing Friday night. You were eating <laughs> good thanks to Riverbend. You've been on this carnivore diet for a while now, and GetRiverbend.com has been your hookup. They've been uh, your go-to for your new carnivore diet. Tell us about Riverbend, Derek. Conrad, right, I'm going to send you some, some of the ground beef that I have. I, I just had it last night. It is the quality of this product is unbelievable it's so different even just i mean it's noticeable I, I i made hamburgers last night that tasted like i was biting into a sirloin steak they're that good and the reason they're that good there's a lot of reasons first of all the the, the meat itself comes from cattle that have been bred meticulously over the course of the last 27 years for flavor, for tenderness, for richness. It's, it's been an ongoing process. The folks at Riverbend process their own meat. 
Everything that, that you get through River, that I get through Riverbed, comes through their own processing facilities. And that's important for a lot of reasons. Going back to the beef again, I got ahead of myself. No hormones, no antibiotics, grass fed at high altitudes in the mountains. Why does that matter? Because it's reflected in the quality of the product. These are not pen raised cattle that eat nothing but grain and, and, and don't get access to grass. Grass fed, no hormones. This is really important to me. No antibiotics, even more important to me. Aged, they not only process, and this is the, this is the game changer. This is the thing that separates Riverbend from everybody else. When you go into your favorite steakhouse, wherever that is in any, any city, and you order the most expensive steak on the menu, 85, 100, 135, $145, whatever it is, I guarantee you, without even knowing the restaurant, that that steak, that meat has been aged because that's the game changer. The reason most people don't do it and you have to pay through the nose to get it is because now you've got all of that inventory hanging in an aging cooler at a very specific temperature and humidity for a period of about 28 or 30 days, 28 days, I think, or 26 days, that it's aged at a specific temperature. And you know, Conrad, you're, you're a much better businessman than I am, having all of that inventory sitting there waiting and you're not making money on it, yep. it costs money. Yep. Riverbend ages all of their product, they package it, vacuum package it, it's sent to your house. It is the best quality meat I've ever had. And if you go to getriverbend.com, you compare the pack, the prices for their packages that you can deliver. You can select from all kinds of different practices and packages. Compare it to other companies that provide the same service and compare the quality of the meat, benefits, and whether it's aged or not, and then compare the price. You'll be shocked, you'll be thanking me, and you'll be enjoying ground beef, steaks, bacon, whatever it is, the way we do. GetRiverbend.com is your hookup. That's G-E-T Riverbend.com. Uh, let's do a few more questions, then we'll wrap this one up. Uh, Denovius Mack wants to know, this is a great question. If Randy Orton was in the Monday Night Wars in WCW, how would you book him? Would he be a heel? Would he be a face? Would you have, uh, how would you have booked him? I mean, we I, mean I, an outro. I don't want to sound obsess obsessive compulsive when it comes to Randy, <laughs> but I love his heel work. I just think he is a heels heel. He, he reminds me of Nick Bockwinkle. He's that heel. And that's a great heel. So I don't know, even if it made more sense on paper for him to be a baby face, because I'm, I love his heel work so much. It would take a lot of conversation and possibly a deadly weapon to get me to change my mind. We know that, uh, WCW was really crowded at the top, you know, just off the top of my head, Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, Sting, Lex Luger, the giant, Randy Savage, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash. Goldberg, DDP. I mean, there's 10, no doubt about it. I mean, we didn't even get into the Booker T's and the Scott Steiners, but there's 10 tippy top guys right away. I ask all of this because coach Keith has a question for us. He says with all the people that are supposedly going back to the WWE, is there enough room for everybody or are top talents going to lose their spots? Or was this a dumb question? I don't think it's a dumb question, Eric, because I do feel like it had to become difficult for you to be a people pleaser for all of your top stars. And now on the WWE side of thing, they've spent a lot of time building LA Knight. Roman Reigns is still the man. We've been trying to build Jimmy and Jay Uso. We've made Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens even bigger stars because of the bloodline and the match was stone cold. Cody's here. Punk is here. Rock's coming back. Randy Orton's back. AJ Styles is back. It feels like everywhere you look, man, there's just top talent. It feels a little bit like peak WCW. Did that present a challenge to you to keep everyone happy and everyone engaged? Such a great, great question because it's the nuance, right? It's you bring in great, you, whoever the, I'm not going to name names, 
you bring in, you're Tony Khan, you bring in a former WWE talent that had been operating at a very, very high level. That's still mid, mid peak of a career, right? You bring that talent in, everybody gets excited. Tony's excited. The audience is excited. Everybody's excited. Internet's excited. Dave Meltzer's excited. Everybody's happy. But you fail to utilize that talent to the talent's expectation or goals. Now, every talent has a different expectation or goal. There are some talents that you can bring in. All they care about is the money. As long as that check keeps showing up, you probably won't hear from them. Believe it or not, those are few and far between. The reason that most talent become talent is because they have this weird drive to perform. I'm one of them. It's just part of who you are. And getting that check in the mail every two weeks, however big it is, is wonderful in the beginning, but it, it's amazing how quickly that emotionally you get very used to the money, almost like I'm owed it. And once that newness, when that new car smell of that big check every two weeks coming in, once that new car smell of that aspect of your life becomes, you become nose blind to it. You don't notice it anymore. It's still a wonderful thing. You're still getting a giant check every two weeks. You have stability. You can plan for your future. You can invest. You can pay off debt. You can send your kids to college. You can do all these great things. And in the beginning, you're excited about it. But after a while, it's like, eh, yeah, okay. But I really want to get out there and perform. Because that's what got you to the point where you can make that kind of money. Most talents that are really passionate about performing, and I would say that's probably 60, 70% of them, they want to get out there and perform. That's where bringing in somebody who's a big name, who's used to being out there and connecting with the audience, getting a reaction, wherever they are on the card, once you take that away from them and you just send them a check, you're going to hear from them. Sometimes it takes them a couple of weeks, a couple of months. Sometimes it'll take a year. But eventually that chatter, that discontent, that frustration of being in the witness protection program, when you bring all of this equity to the table that everybody was so excited about initially, and now nobody can find you. It's it's frustrating as a talent. And then that chatter starts to, you hear the murmurings in the background, the rest of the roster, the friends, the families, whatever. And it starts getting a little hotter and it becomes a problem. Managing talent. First of all, managing talent is an art form in itself. My hat's off to JR or anybody else that's ever done it and successfully at the level that JR did it, especially, bam, that's a job all by itself. You need to be a shrink. You need to be a counselor. You need to be a friend. You need to be a husband. You need to be a wife. You need to be a brother. You need to be so many different things to really manage talent. But the, one, the other thing you really need to do is show them that they have real opportunity. Hey, you mentioned Jr. I wanted to ask about him, and then we'll put a button on this week's episode. Uh, I recently did an episode with Jim, and as we were doing our discussion, we did it. You don't. Here's a peek behind the curtain. We normally record on a Wednesday morning. We wound up recording on a Thursday morning because AEW did their homecoming show in Jacksonville. So I wanted to be able to talk to Jim one morning removed from him being back at AEW because. They ran Oklahoma recently when he was at his Oklahoma house. Now they've run Jacksonville when he was at his Jacksonville home. So we got to just talk about his experience. And through the course of our conversation, he disclosed, and I couldn't believe this, his contract's up February 14th. So he's finishing up with AEW on, on February 14th. Maybe they'll resign him. Maybe they won't. I don't know. But as a fan, I said a few weeks ago, I really thought it would be cool if he and Tony Schiavone were on the call for Sting's last match. If you go back and you watch that very first clash of the champions, uh, from 1988, it was Ric Flair and sting. And that show is one of the first times that Tony Schiavone was on a call with Jim Ross, because that was right after the whole Watts thing had happened, yada, yada, yada. But I thought that would be really cool to put them back together for what was stings match that sort of put him on the map in Greensboro with Ric Flair. Now have him together on the call with Tony Schiavone with Ric Flair in his corner for Sting's last match in the same building as a wrestling fan who loves the old school. I could get excited about that. I hope it happens, but that's a few weeks after his contract expires. If you were Tony, would you can, would you try to keep Jr on the payroll? Would you let Jr retire peacefully if that's what he wants to do? 
or would you leave him on the board knowing that he could certainly go to WWE as well? I feel like they've been doing a good job with Jim when they've used him recently, where he's coming in for main events. It, he does give that big fight feel and make the main event feel special. If you were calling the shots, what would you do with Jim Ross and his contract in 2024? I would make Jim Ross the Hulk Hogan of announcers for my company. Make him an attraction. Keep yeah. him special. Build up his legacy. Showcase him. Make him the John Madden, if you will, of, of, of professional wrestling. Because that's who he is. It's not even make him that. It's take advantage of the fact that he is and promote it and build it and use him in the right spots. Much like they used Undertaker towards the end of his career. Much like we used Hogan initially before the NWO. Four times a year. Four pay-per-views a year. He's an attraction. Yeah. Much like they've done with The Rock. Much like they've done with John Cena. The formula is right there for everybody to see. It's not like I'm reinventing a wheel here, folks. Right. It works. It's a play. Go to the playbook. It works. Build him up. Make him that voice. Don't overexpose him. Jim is at that stage of his career too, right? Travels harder. It's just, look, yeah. it's, it is. It is what it is, folks. And and Jim's had a couple of health issues that you know, slow him down along the way, as well as personal issues that, that help slow him down along the way. But the talent is still there. It's up to you as a producer to take advantage of that asset. The asset and its benefits don't just show up. You have to find ways to exploit the asset to maximize the benefits. And Jim Ross is a perfect example of how and why Tony should do that. I hope he does it. I think the world of Jim, I think he's the voice of wrestling. It's not just a gimmick. He really is. And I think he would be important for this next round of television rights for whoever, like whoever is going to be making uh, a new deal for a television show on their network, they're going to want to know what's it going to look like, what's it going to sound like, what's it going to feel like. And I think JR having uh, all that brand equity and all that legacy, that adds a lot, you know, no disrespect to the other announced team. I love the route. I think the world of Taz and Excalibur and Nigel and Kevin Kelly and but if you grew up in every, the one of, every one of those names are doing a great job. Absolutely. But you've got, as you said, the Hulk Hogan of announcing the Babe Ruth of announcing you, you, you want to be able to play that card when you need it. And we greatly appreciate you guys tuning in today here for 83 weeks. It was a bit of a different episode. We're going to do, uh, do some new experimenting and we're even going to try going live on YouTube in the new year. So if you haven't already, what are you waiting for? Go hit the subscribe button and turn on the notifications bell at 83 weeks on youtube.com. And if you've got a question for us or a response, uh, we would love to hear from you on social media. Eric is very active. He would love to uh, spar with you at E Bischoff on Twitter or X, whatever you call it. He's also on Instagram at the real Eric Bischoff. You'll get to see his dog and his sauna and his lovely wife, and you'll <laughs> see it, the grandkids and the whole deal. But you can interact with the show at 83 weeks on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. By the way, if you're looking to promote your product or service, we would love to get your message to men 25 to 54. That's about 97% of our audience, which is why you hear some of the same advertisers over and over and over because it really works. Find out how affordable it can be at advertisewitheric.com. And I also want to mention if one of your new year's resolutions was to save money, uh, I know a guy. It's me, savewithconrad.com. We're going to show you how to throw a couple of house payments over the top rope. How about that? No house payments in February, no house payments in March. You're done until April. It's going to be wrestle freaking mania before you're making another house payment. And if you, like I, maybe overspent a little bit, went over budget during the holiday season, maybe you put Christmas on a credit card. Does that sound familiar? But don't get stuck paying the minimum payment. Don't dread opening those Discover bills or American Express card bills. Just go to savewithconrad.com. Not only can we get you a much better interest rate, but the rate you pay on those credit cards, besides being astronomically high, it's also not tax deductible. Whereas the interest you pay on your mortgage is tax deductible. So if you could skip a couple of house payments, get rid of your credit card debt, get a greater tax deduction and get a lower monthly payment, why wouldn't you do that? We're routinely helping some of our podcast listeners 
say five, six, seven, even 800 bucks a month. And it's free to find out how much money you can save right now. We've got an A plus with the BBB and a ton of five-star reviews over at conradreviews.com. Check out our most recent one here from Robert CC. He gave us 4.75 stars. He tells us that he now owns his first home thanks to Larry and Francis's great work. And he did it at 56 years old. I get that question all the time. Is it, is, have I waited too late? Am I never going to, yeah, you can do it. Buddy, the first step, whether you're looking to get out of debt or buy a house is to go to savewithconrad.com. It's no cost, no obligation. Just tell us what your goals are, short-term and long-term, and we're going to help you get there and have a lot of fun doing it. Savewithconrad.com. You have a friend in the mortgage business. Why not use it? If you've got questions about buying a house, about credit cards, about credit scores, about how to go about buying a house, before you go sign a lease on an apartment, at least talk to us, get a game plan together. We don't say no, we say not yet, but here's how at savewithconrad.com. NMLS number 32416, Equal Housing Lender, savewithconrad.com. Eric, I never know what to expect when we click record, and I damn sure didn't expect you to be gone because you got a PP. We took it all out of Eric this week. Thought he was going to come in hot on Tony and FDR. <laughs> he did it right in the nick of time. I, I tried to beat that read. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> I, uh, I, I was a little nervous clicking record today. I knew you were going to ready to be ready to go to war and do some more games. I wore my camo. I stopped short of putting some, uh, some more paint on, but man, this was fun today and we lived and FTR lived and we'll live to fight another day. It was, it was, it was fun. I, I, I always enjoy doing the show. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, you know, when you talk about narrative, this show is fun for me. Like it's one of the, I, you know, I love my life and I, I got a lot of other things going on in my life, but this show allows me to kind of stay a little bit connected, you know, to the, to the business and talk about it in a way that's fun for me. And I love working with you. Dave Silva does a great job. So thank everybody for listening. I, I, I hope you find it entertaining because I'm entertaining the hell out of myself. And we're going to do it again next week, right here on 83 weeks with Eric Bischoff. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson here to tell you a little more about what adfreeshows.com is all about. Get early ad-free access to more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts every single week, starting at just nine bucks. That's less than 20 cents an episode each month. And yes, you can listen to them all directly through Apple podcasts or your regular podcast apps. How easy is that? Ad-Free Shows also has thousands of hours worth of bonus content and docu-series like Title Chase, Eric Fires Back, Conversations with Conrad, and The Insiders, plus new series like The Book with David Crockett, Monday Mailbags with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick, and a whole lot more. And you want to talk about early, you can't get any earlier than listening to the shows live. You can be a part of the live studio audience as we record the podcast. Plus, ride shotgun alongside your favorite childhood heroes for live watch-alongs, Q&As, and other interactive experiences every single month. Come on now, see for yourself what thousands of other wrestling fans from around the world have discovered that adfreeshows.com is the best value in wrestling. Check it out today, and hey, when you do, the first week is completely free, adfreeshows.com. <laughs>